Good evening. I'd like to welcome everybody to the April 17th meeting of the St. Mary's County Planning Commission. There are two sign-up sheets out in the foyer this evening. One is a sign-up sheet if you're speaking. The other is a sign-up sheet for the attendees of these hearings. In case any further information needs to be sent to you regarding these cases, please sign up on these sheets. Our meeting is being recorded for the public record. Any comments made by anyone present must be recorded as part of the record. Therefore, if you have anything to say, you must come up to one of the microphones provided. Your comments cannot be recorded and placed in the record unless they are directed to a microphone. You are to direct your statements, questions, or responses to the board only, and we will direct them to the appropriate person for an answer. Please keep your comments to three minutes or less. Anyone testifying or asking questions during our public hearings this evening will be required to take an oath. Uh, also, would you um, please speak close to the microphone when you come up to it and silence your cell phones. Uh, thank you for your cooperation. Let's see, on our agenda this evening, after uh, review and approval of the minutes for the April 10th meeting, uh, we have one public hearing this evening. That's CSP 22-0269, Stewart's Grant uh, PUD, and that's a continuance. Um, the owner is Stewart's Grant LLC, uh, and the action requested this evening is a review of a concept site plan for 619, let me make this so I can read it, 619 townhouses, 279 single-family dwellings detached, and a four-story multifamily apartment building with 224 units for a total of 1,122 dwelling units. The PUD contains a 20-acre commercial area also. Okay, at this time I'll let the board members introduce yourself, starting with Mr. Brown. John Brown. Kim Summers. Joe St. Clair. Howard Thompson. Joe Van Kirk. Joe Vizikas. Merle Evans. Okay, also with us this evening, our county staff from Land Use and Growth, De uh, growth Development, Land Use and Growth Management. Um, their acting director is Courtney Jenkins is here. Their planner uh, is Brandy Glenn, and Jessica Birch is their administrative coordinator. Also with us uh, in the supporting county staff are John Hauser is our assistant county attorney. Mr. Jim Gotch is the director of public works, and Jesse Harper is also there from the Department of Public Works. Um, I don't see Ms. Hollander, but I hope we have a representative from the Metropolitan Commission or, and Anna Wells, Anna Wells here. Uh, Alec Young from the Patuxent River Naval Air Station Community Planning Liaison's Office uh, from the Department of uh, Economic Development, Casey Gidry. Our video media producer this evening is Amy Carter. And from St. Mary's County Public Schools, we have Alex Jaffers, Kim Howe, and, Ms. and Dr. Scott Smith. I hope I didn't rate, miss anybody. Okay. Did everybody have a chance to review those minutes from April 10th? Mr. Sorry. Chairman, I make a, a motion to approve the minutes from April 10th. Okay, I have a motion from Mr. Fazekas. Do I have a second? I second. Second from Ms. Summers. All in favor of that, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Abstention. Thank you, sir. Okay. Moving right along, as I say, our first case this evening will be the concept uh, site plan for the Stewart's Grant PUD. I just gave you all the vitals on that, so I won't have to go through that again. Uh, all persons um, testifying or asking questions uh, during this hearing this evening, I'd like to go ahead and swear you in at this time. I also, because of my memory, which is pretty good most of the time, but I will ask you to make sure that I swore you in when you get up to speak. So. Anybody's going to speak? We want to go ahead and <laughs> the room. I like to get a picture in my head. Uh, do you declare and affirm under the penalty of perjury that the testimony, responses, and statements you may give will be the whole truth and nothing but the truth? I think I do. Okay, thank you. Okay, Brandy. Okay. Good evening. Agenda item one is a concept site plan CSP 220269 for the Stewart's Grant PUD. 
The concept site plan seeks approval for 619 townhouses, 279 single family dwellings detached, and a four story multifamily apartment building with 224 units for a total of 1,122 dwelling units. The PUD contains a 20 acre commercial area as well. The site is located off of Great Mills Road. The land use is mixed use, medium intensity, residential high density, and residential medium density. The zoning is medium intensity, mixed use, residential high density, and residential medium density with the PUD R and PUD CP overlay. The uses allowed in and de development regulations for development in the medium intensity mixed use zoning district are intended to create large scale and clustered commercial and residential uses adjacent to existing or planned principal transportation corridors. <coughs> the range of density of residential development in the residential high density zoning district is between 10 and 20 dwellings per acre. The range of density of residential development in the residential medium density zoning district <coughs> is between one and 10 dwellings per acre. Per the comprehensive plan, primary growth centers are Lexington Park and Leonardtown. Urban in pattern and form designated for intensive residential, commercial, and industrial development supported by a priority for provision of community facilities, services, and amenities. <coughs> Use type 14, dwelling unit attached. A structure containing multiple dwelling units placed side by side, sharing common walls, but each unit has a separate front and rear access. Includes townhouses and duplexes. Use type 15, dwelling unit detached. A detached structure containing a single dwelling unit. Dwelling may be either a slight built structure meeting the St. Mary's County Building Code or a modular structure for residential occupancy conforming to the requirements of the Maryland Industrialized Building Act. Mobile homes are regulated separately under this ordinance. Brandy, quick question. Back up to sure. the, next, the previous one. Describe to me modular structure. So a modular structure is a dwelling, a stick belt, stick built structure or dwelling built offsite. Offsite. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Use type 16, dwelling unit multifamily residence, a single structure that contains three or more dwelling units that share common entrances and exits. Classification includes structures commonly called apartments or condominiums. The public notice for the Planning Commission public hearing was published in Southern Maryland News on December 23rd and December 30th. The property has been posted in accordance with CZO requirements section 21.3.3. Certified mail receipts have been received and have been entered into the record of this public hearing as Exhibit 1. The Planning Commission met on January 9th and continued the public hearing on the record to March 27th. On March 27th, the public hearing was again continued on the record until April 17th. The concept site plan was submitted for review and distributed to TEC agencies on October 17th, 2022. The use of dwelling unit attached, dwelling unit detached, and dwelling unit multifamily residence are permitted uses in the MXM, RH, RM, PUD R, and PUD CP zoning districts. For all non residential and multifamily residential projects that require major site plan approval, a concept site plan shall first be approved by the Planning Commission before the major site plan may be processed for approval by the Planning Director. This is a public hearing which enables all who wish to provide information to the Planning Commission in order to approve the concept site plan. The Planning Commission shall make the findings that the proposed development <coughs> is consistent with the comprehensive plan and applicable functional plans, may be served by adequate public facilities as required by section 70.2.2. .2. Please note per 70.14, PUDs approved prior to September 4th 4th, 2008 are grandfathered from school adequacy requirements if they have satisfied APF requirements. Will promote the health, safety, and welfare of the general public. Adequately developed recreational and other community amenities are provided in accordance with the comprehensive plan and the comprehensive zoning ordinance. Is consistent with chapter 62 design objectives 
per section 44.8.4, the Planning Commission shall consider and determine whether the site plan is substantially in accordance with the approved development plan. And there's a, just a couple um, outstanding issue, issues. The applicant must obtain authorization from MDE Wetlands and water, Waterways Protection Program for impacts to wetlands and waterways and a variance to disturb the wetland buffer. This concludes the staff report and is entered into the record of the public hearing as exhibit two. Paige Wyro is here re representing the applicant. Brandy, before you start, could you go back to the, the APF part of the presentation? Th this, this. Or schools? There. So could you, for everyone, sort of give us an overview with regard to that second bullet and what that means prior to September 4th, 2008, or grandfather from school adequacy requirements? I can speak to that one, Good. Mr. Evans. As what we're getting at there is, uh, again, uh, for the benefit of those watching and uh, refreshing recollection from three weeks ago, uh, PUDs are dealt with a little bit differently than other concept site plans this planning commission sees more regularly. A planning uh, planned unit development's development plan is the controlling ordinance, and if there are provisions in that PUD resolution that differ from the comprehensive zoning ordinance or the comprehensive zoning ordinance's normal process, it's the PUD document that is going to control. The <coughs> kind of twisting, torturous way we get to an adequate public facilities determination by the Planning Commission, even though there is a PUD on place. And again, I'll, I know Mr. Wyro is still holding in reserve his right to dispute the county's determination that they are subject to a APF, any sort of analysis or finding by the Planning Commission at all, even for this stage. And as before, we're going to respect uh, Mr. Wyro and his clients' right to reserve on that and the ability to challenge uh, the county's determination on that one. And by them going forward tonight, they're not waiving a right to appeal or seek judicial relief. Uh, they're going through the process trying to honor the way the county wants, but they're still holding on that question. But the way the county looks at it is that both the PUD document and the CZO then and now say that when a PUD development plan is placed, you still go through the site plan applications, procedures, and standards of what was in 1997, Article 5 of the Comprehensive Zoning Ordinance, what is now Article 6 of the Comprehensive Zoning Ordinance. That, among other things, says you have a concept site plan, you present the concept site plan to the Planning Commission. The Planning Commission goes through the normal uh, standards it has to meet. And then the Planning Commission votes to move forward on the concept site plan. From then on, once we have a concept site plan for the development entire, all 1,122 units, from then on, the applicant is going to present more detailed and uh, particular site plans for each phase that will then come, because this project will have a build out of approximately 10 to 12 years. So we won't see all 1,122 housing units dropped in at once. That major site plan is then reviewed and actual APF determinations are made by planning director at that time. What the planning commission has got to do right now is make an APF finding as to whether adequate public facilities may be met at the time these will actually go forward over that 10 to 12 years. The bit about schools in particular is what makes this different than any other APF, than most other APF facilities, because 70.14 does say that when it comes to the APF analysis, the Planning Commission does, that school capacity is exempt for subdivisions that were on record before September 4th, 2007, as well as any planned unit development that is on record before September 4th, 2007. It is rare that in this job I see language as clear or as simple as that. It doesn't mean that schools are totally out of the question whatsoever. The planning, um, the county's position is that the PUD document still says that there has to be a specific analysis and finding of adequate public facilities for, among other things, schools at the time those major site plans go forward over the 10 to 12 years, and the chunks of this project come before the plan or the Department of Land Use and Growth Management again and again, but schools are not part of the Planning Commission's APF findings tonight based on that language in 70.14. Mr. Hauser, is there a 
time limit on when a PUD is in force, meaning um, a, a PUD was, was granted 2007-2008. Uh, um, is that still valid without any variance uh, like in the year 2100, or is there some kind of uh, uh, timeline that it has to follow? There's no expiration date when it comes to PUDs. Unless there were an actual drop dead date or a sunset provision in the PUD document itself, there's nothing in the Comprehensive Zoning Ordinance, and there is nothing in our particular development plan for Stewart's grant that says that if it is not done by such and such a date, the project terminates. The only mechanism for revoking a PUD is if the PUD grows either one year behind construction um, deadlines, or if the project on a whole exceeds more than 15 years, then the county commissioners may, in their discretion, hold a hearing to consider revocation or an amendment of a PUD to account for the delay. That is something that exclusively rests within the county commissioner's discretion. The planning commission does not make any sort of findings or determinations on whether this PUD is, for lack of a better word, timely. It is solely within the county commissioner's power to do that. And the process itself is not as simple as the county commissioner sending a letter to a developer that says you are behind schedule, the PUD is no good. Uh, there is a process and the PUD cannot be easily stripped away. At a minimum, there has to be 60 days notice provided to, the app to an applicant of an intention to hold a hearing on revoking the PUD. You must then have a public hearing on revoking the PUD. Then the commissioners have to make their own findings of facts and determination as to whether in fact that would be appropriate or would amount to an improper taking of what a court would consider a cognizable property right on the part of the developer. Thank you. Mr. Hauser. did I hear you right when you said that if chunks of this come forward in different phases, um, that it will be determined at the time that uh, the APF has been met? Yes, so what would happen, say that six years from hence, we're in phase five of 10 of Stewart's grant and those are not, just to be clear for the record, those are numbers I'm pulling out out of nowhere, um, just to give an illustrative example. Samples. What we would do when, say, when the 100 or 112 or so houses that would be associated with that phase would come due, then the planning director at Lugham would look at it and make the adequate public facilities of whether adequate public facilities, roads, school seats, water, et cetera, exist for only those 100 or so houses that are gonna be put in in that next phase. And that would be done again at the time that application for a, we'll call it a major site plan would be made. To follow up on that, so what you're really saying is at this point in time is the only time that we'll have public input to this. So there would not be public hearings associated with the planning director's That's, review, correct. Okay. Now how much li open liability do we have under all these PUDs if this, if if we have this issue with this PUD, have we racked up all the PUDs that we have on file and then determined whether or not they have met at a good public facility and in effect have a liability toward APF issues? I've asked Logan to be looking into that. To the best of our knowledge right now, the review, and I'm not gonna say this is final or official, but we are certainly looking at it and will have final and official figures soon to make sure of it. There's no other quote unquote inactive PUD of similar size or scope on the books right now. The only one that comes close is Shannon Farms, which is owned by the St. Mary's County itself right now, and I'm not aware of the commissioners having any active plans to develop it. That's the only thing within any arena close to Stewart's grant. PUDs that we still have active that are currently going under build out, uh, Oak Crest. Crest, First Colony, and it's still decades later, Wildwood. But again, those projects are all compliant and they're not, numbers are not under those PUDs being proposed similar to what we've got today. There's no another inactive PUD from 25 years ago that is going to drop another 1,100 housing units in St. Mary's County. Mr. Hauser, my question is, do we have any idea at this point where the county commissioners stand on this PUD? Are they going to be discussing this? Is that something that they do prior to us meeting or would that happen after our meeting? How would that how would that go forward? So I can't speak for the county commissioners. I do not know that consideration of the PUD is on the commissioner's agenda now or will be in the future. So there's no, 
actions that I know of at this time, that there would be an additional review beyond the planning commissions tonight by the county commissioners at any level of this project. Going back in history a little bit, I was always told since I was on the planning commission that the planning commission itself is the lightning rod for the county commissioners. This is where everything is aired out. They get to hear what's going on and it basically keeps them informed. Mr. Hazard. So we're here to determine if, if there's adequate public facilities. Is it for the entire 1,122 dwelling units at on today's date, or could you clarify? No, so it's if we're parsing the language here, it's the planning director who would at the time of the major site plans make the determination that adequate public facilities do in fact exist at that time. And if they do not in fact exist at that time, the planning director's missive or directive is to deny the approval until APF exists. What the planning commission does is consider whether or not APF may exist at the time they are needed. So in more kind of colorful, flowerful English, uh, the planning commission, what it's charged with tonight is to look over the anticipated build out of 10 to 12 years and figure out over that next decade whether or not APF, if they do not exist today, will they exist at that time? Or is there a mechanism by which they may exist at that time when it's actually time for APF to be met by the planning director? So to paraphrase what you just said, regardless of how we decide, well, let's just say um, this, this uh, commission uh, votes in the affirmative for this project today. That's not the end of it. For each phase, it goes through an individual review by the county to see whether or not adequate public facilities exist. And if there are not enough adequate public facilities, it could be denied. Uh, correct. What I'm gonna do is just to clear the air, I'll read in the record uh, from page 97 of the Stewart's Grant Planning uh, Development Plan, paragraph 15, the planning director shall approve, approve subject to modifications or disapprove each detailed site plan. Oh, pardon me, wrong paragraph. Give me a, um, what you do need to require is that there has to be an analysis of specific findings of adequate public facilities at the time. Tell you what, uh, let me reserve on that question from right now, find the right sticky note in this binder, okay. and at some point tonight I'll come back and read that into the record. Okay. At what point in time does the county commissioners step in? If we vote, say, yep, yes or no, um, when do the county commissioners step in? That's up to them. Yes. I'm Good. Good. Uh, uh, Mr. Hauser, I just, I'm, I guess I'm struggling with this whole crystal ball scenario. Um, I've been on this board for almost five and a half years now. Um, and I didn't live in the county 12 years ago. Um, and I'm not really quite sure what 12 years from now is going to look at. So am I just being asked to use my best fair judgment on where I anticipate we're gonna be 12 years from now? I think, I think the way I would describe it is not necessarily even to put your shoes of the planning director 10 years hence and decide what's most likely the outcome they're going to reach at that time. Mm -hmm. It's to decide whether or not there's the possibility that the planning director may be able to approve, whether there's a set of facts or circumstance that's reasonably possible that APF may be able to be met in the future. It's, I think, trying to make a finding as to whether or not that possibility can exist is all the planning commission is charged with tonight. And it did come to me, uh, it was not page 97, paragraph 15, it was paragraph three off the 97 uh, resolution creating the PUD, an analysis and specific finding of the adequacy of transportation, water supply and sewage disposal, stormwater management, provision of adequate school facilities and the suppression of fire hazards that may be associated with the development shall be required prior to any subsequent requests for subdivision plat approval and or site development approval. Thank you. I think a comparison to this is when you brought up other PUDs, uh, Wildwood, for instance, they come before us every year, give us an update on what they have. They still have several hundred more homes to be built. When they go into, I'll say they're different phases, they go to Lugham, and Lugham 
see if they have adequate public facilities for that. For That's the, correct. For that. It's not. It's not entirely dissimilar from forget the unique world of PUDs. It's not at all dissimilar to what usually happens with concept site plan and major site plans. When concept site plans outside of PUDs come before the Planning Commission, it's the same standard of determining whether or not APF may be met at the time of final site plan approval. Always when the concept site plan approval process goes through the Planning Commission, there's always still the backstop to that, the actual finding of APF by the Planning Director at the time of major site plan approval. Do, do we know if the school board has any projections into the, uh, they have to for planning of additional schools? I mean, I, I can't any help there for I, this board? I can't speak for the school board. Is there a representative of the school board here tonight? Um, I, I do think there are, and that's we'll come up. the commission's call whether or not they want to um, invite them up to offer any testimony. Okay, we're still in staff report time. I didn't say it at the beginning, but as I did in the last hearing and there was a little um, un unhappiness with the way the, the hearing went that night, uh, we go to 10 o'clock. Uh, that's when we cut off. If it looks like at uh, five minutes to 10, there's one more person that's gonna speak, we'll go to a little bit after 10, but our, our general way that we do things are we go till 10 o'clock. If it looks like it's gonna need continuation, if we're getting into a certain point of the, of the case, say at 9.30, um, and it looks like it's gonna take a substantial amount of time, I will ask the, the applicant, you know, if it's all right, if we continue, if, it's, if we can come together for a um, meeting of the minds on that, uh, to, to agree on that, then we will um, pick a date uh, certain for a continuation. I just want to remind the audience of that, uh, depending upon how long the hearing goes. You know, I want the public to be able to hear it. At the last one, it um, it didn't go over that well, um, but I just want to make sure that you know everybody can can get their time. Okay, Brandy, were you finished with your part? I'm I'm, I'm finished. Okay. Is there any other questions of staff while we're just just a comment? I think that with regard to PUDs, when the Wellwood PUD has been in place for years, but when Evergreen was to be constructed, I think there were a lot of expectations within Wildwood that their children would all go to Wild, would all go to Evergreen. Um, unless I'm wrong, the capacity of Evergreen was never going to accommodate all of Wildwood. Um, and I can remember sitting in that, standing in that auditorium when they, when they did the ribbon cutting that day, and I asked someone standing there, who, who among you are going to tell these folks that the capacity uh, for Wildwood, uh, that, that Evergreen won't be able to address that? Um, and so I think that, I, I've been sitting here for a long time, and, and I will tell you that my concerns with regards with regard to schools and adequate public facility. And I understand what you said, John. Um, I also, and this is not my call, this is the developer's call. When, when it comes time for that first phase or the second phase or the third phase, when they have to, someone has to find for APF, for schools, will the schools be available? Currently, uh, the site for high school was taken out of the CIP. There is no plan for a school to be constructed currently, I don't believe. We have a site on Route 5 for, a, I think, a middle, middle uh, elementary, I think. Um, but because the donation, in my view, because the donation of the land, it seems to me, they believe that, the, the applicant believes that because they made that donation of land to, uh, for Carver, and for Great Mills, that it somehow has guaranteed them of seats. Uh, and, and, and as far as I'm concerned, that's not, that's not accurate. No seats are no seats, plain and simple. You know, unless you can find for seats, unless they can find for APF for, for schools, they're gonna be denied. That's my concern. I mean, I'm not saying that my job tonight is to 
figure out whether or not they may be available. My concern is, are they available? Will they be available? And is the infrastructure that's required, not by them, but by the county, will the county have addressed the need for that infrastructure in a timely manner? It's why we pay taxes. You know, we, you know, we, we pay those taxes, and we're not really sure about that right now, John. We don't know how the impact fees our impact fees are gone. We don't know how, with the money, how it's going to be generated. Who's who's going to get what? Um, and so there's a lot of lot of a lot of things I don't understand. I mean, and and it's not to say that I should understand everything, but I sure as hell should be able to understand either kids, either seats are available in schools or they're not. Long and short of it. And so you know, we we do have people here tonight from the board of education that may want to correct most of what I said, but I'm just, that's my, those are my understandings, John. So. If it goes to the director and the director finds that there is, they have, that there, there is no adequate public facilities, what is the next move by the county? I mean. <laughs> that's probably above my pay grade as well. And I know that when we get into school, the school board is going to be better at speaking this than I, because my understanding of the actual mechanism by which uh, we can get additional school seats built or funded by the state is rudimentary at best. My understanding is that one of the pitfalls of the process is that, uh, pitfall is probably what some would call it, I'm sure there's more generous terminology out there that I should have used, but my understanding is that you cannot begin to start getting funding for school seats from the state until you're already over capacity by a certain amount. Otherwise, the state won't recognize a need for additional dollars to be sent to your jurisdiction versus others. That's part of the process. We are going to have to refer to a better subject matter expert than I from there. My understanding is that the discussion doesn't really begin until we get closer to using up the school seats that we actually still have on the books as of right now. When it, when it comes time to the Board of Education, what I'm looking for from them is that they do budgets, they do five-year, 10-year projections. Um, they know what the population is moving into the county, uh, what's still on the books, how many EDUs are sitting there, and what's being proposed. Um, and, and so again, I do also want to take a moment that it, Planning Commission is can inquire to whatever it would like in terms of adducing information for the public's benefit. Anything is fair game to ask after. The public can speak about whatever they would like. But when it comes down to what the Planning Commission actually votes on tonight, is that school capacity is not in the Planning Commission's remit for this decision. The CZO, as I read 70.14, is very clear on that. It has its moment in front of the Planning Director, but it's not something that the Planning Commission can properly base its vote one way or the other upon tonight. So we see a crash coming, but we're not allowed to do anything about it. It's what you basically put out there. So 70.14 says that adequate school seats is not subject for the board or the planning commission to decide upon tonight. It, 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 we can identify a problem. Like I said, and adduce Mr. Information, Houser, but that is not we see a crash coming, but because of the regulations that you're quoting, we're not allowed to prevent that. So Mr. Brown, yes. The way 70.14 reads is that with respect to school seat capacity, this PUD is grandfathered in for planning commission concept site plan review. And that decision will be made by Logan at, at the point of uh, the application for whatever phase that may be. Correct. School seats, whether adequate school seats exist or not, will be reviewed by the planning director at Department of Land Use and Growth Management for each individual phase of development as it comes along. Okay. And to wrap up an uh, answer to your earlier question, Mr. Sinclair, is that if adequate public facilities, regardless of what the plan is to do something about it, doesn't exist at the time those concept, those individual phases come along, then if the pl planning director cannot <coughs> make the APF determination, the planning director cannot approve the major site plan for that next phase until APF exists. Now again, uh, the applicant, the developer is 
debate and whether we've even got the right to do that. And that probably may become a point of contention in the future if APF does five, six, seven years out from now become an issue. But again, that is the county's position, the way we would apply the code looking at it tonight. So that's the only tool that we have is through the director at the time that the concept site plan is brought before them to make sure that it's adequate public facilities. Correct. For schools, because the only way this gets in front of the Planning Commission at all tonight is by going through Article 6's concept site plan review. And that pushes us to Chapter 70 for finding of adequate public facilities. And 70.14, the very end of that chapter, says that the provisions of this chapter with respect to school seats do not apply to a planned unit development approved prior to September 4th, 2008. We can consider other APF. You can consider our contention the way we believe, and again, disputed with reserving a right to appeal by the developer, but we do think the rest of APF, the rest of the APF analysis, is within the Planning Commission's remit tonight. Okay, thank you. So the developer is aware that he could come up uh, with the next phase and if, that, say water and sewer. Um, what would stop that from moving forward? Uh, they have the EDUs and the other EDUs are there. Um, they can move, still move forward, correct? Uh, for METCOM, I've got to either defer to the developer or METCOM's representative on where exactly things stand with METCOM. I know that was a bit of a uh, issue to figure out in the lead up. I'm not sure of what the status of their discussions with METCOM is right now, but I'm sure the developer will be able to apprise you of that and what the plan is moving forward on that front. Well, hopefully METCOM can speak to that tonight. Yeah, we'll get to them when we get to them. So yeah. also what That's you're saying point. is the developer is taking one major risk that part way through his investment, he will be ground to a halt and have to sit back as everybody goes through the planning and building process if there's an APF issue. I think that's fair to say. So they're, they're really kind of have their butt hanging out here too. <laughs> the other thing that I want to mention as well is that it, it's our charge tonight, according to the presentation, that we are to make findings that the proposed development will promote health, safety, and welfare of the general public, but yet we're not allowed to look at the whole picture. That's, that's difficult. And I understand. I think I can see where that's coming from. I think the issue we get into there legally is that you cannot use a general standard, like a general uh, charge to look into the health, wealth, or health, welfare, and safety of the public and use that to defeat a specific part of the code. But I can't say that that general power basically allows me to rewrite, abolish, or invalidate another section of the code. What we get into then is a you basically get into a conflict of our own laws where the one can't stand next to the other, and that's fruitful ground for any developer to come up or any applicant whatsoever to come up and allege that the county's um, various bodies are acting in a manner arbitrary and capricious and that nobody really has any general expectation or ability to predict how the code is going to be applied. And those are the kind of situations that make it very easy to overturn actions of a local government, which are typically treated with very great deference by a court when it comes to making findings of fact and applying its own regulations. But it's that type of situation that, as I said, is fruitful ground to get things overturned on appeal. Anything else, Mr. I, can I jump in? Um, and it's really not you, Mr. Hauser. Go back to the young lady giving the staff report. I want to ask a question relative to the TEC. I don't see any input from emergency services or fire. Is there any involvement of there in that process? The fire board would have received the the um, the site plan. So you, can, can you move closer to your, yeah, to your the, mic? So the fire board would have received the site plan. If you didn't receive comments, then they didn't have any. They didn't, and the emergency department, in effect, had no input so the So emergency services, they don't get it copied. They're not part of the TC. Yet they provide, okay. That's, that's very interesting. But Mr. Brown, also. Service aren't part of it. 
Mr. Brown also realized that the Sheriff's Department uh, gave, uh, provided a public comment about their concerns about traffic and safety. Well, I'm well aware of where that came from. Okay. Uh, but I think they uh, answered the question. They originally were part of the TEC and kind of dropped out, right? They are, they are part of TEC. Now they are, okay. They, they always have been. Okay. But that doesn't include the emergency services side or the fire side. I understand that. The the fire board. I understand, but they don't. They didn't even send back a negative. Like some of these people, circle their little form and say no input. He so how do you know, how do we really know they have been addressed the issue? Okay, so what I'll do is I can go back to the file and I'll verify and send that to you. They're, he'll, well, he'll send, I just want to know that he'll they, send something back that says no comments, and I'll send that to you. And anything else? Thank you, Brian. You're welcome. Thank you, Mr. Hauser. Thank you, John. Thank you, John. Mr. Well, we'll stick around, Mr. Hauser. Oh, no, he's not going nowhere. Not going anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> he's, got a, he's got an ankle bracelet on. We're not, he can't leave the room. <laughs> <laughs> Except for a couple of minutes, you know, we won't talk about why. Yes, sir. Are you the sole sole speaker? I'm sorry. As, are you the sole speaker right now for the, uh, for for the a moment? Because I think there are some comments that have been made that I've got to address. Okay. All right. So. I, I don't know why everybody or the, we've heard comments that a crash crash is coming. Mr. Wyro, with respect to school seats. Why don't you introduce yourself? I'm sorry, Paige Wyro, on behalf of the applicant. I thought I did. Thank you, sir. Right now, we at the last hearing, we indicated to you that we had reduced the number of units from what was originally proposed. They did a school seat analysis originally, which was done incorrectly. They modified it, and based on the reduction in units, there is capacity today in all three schools. And that the initially the overage in the, the projected overage in capacity in the initial report was years out. This project is not gonna cause the school system in St. Mary's County to come to a screeching halt. It's simply not. Mr. Evans, the last time I was here, you and you made some comments tonight about a guarantee, which we'll disagree on in a moment, but there were also concerns raised um, at the last hearing about developers coming before this body and other county bodies and then not doing what they said. I didn't say that. Well, no, I didn't say you did. Other people had. Don't, don't no, 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 no. I'm not trying to put words in your mouth. I didn't I'm say not. that. I, I'm not. I know you didn't. I know you I, I, I know you did, other people, not you. But last time we, okay, I, I understand. But you, tonight you talked about the guarantee. I did. And I wanna to speak to that for a minute. Sure. This project gave 40 acres to the school system in St. Mary's County. Carver would not exist but for that donation. And as Mr. Evans, you indicated last time, there probably were conversations back when that second donation had to be made. And that second donation was not made based upon a requirement issued by this body. Somebody in county government approached Mr. Knott and they made the donation with the expectation that they were gonna help satisfy the school seats. At the time it was given was back in 2004, the growth in this county was exploding. So you're right, no guarantee, but there were expectations made as, as we said last time. So now, what I hear from you all is that the crash is coming. You're going to take ground that this developer gave the Board of Education, and you're going to give away the benefit of it to other folks. That's he really gave wrong. you. He, so, so there was there were expectations. There's there's absolutely you're right. There's nothing guaranteed and written right but but there was an expectation and and now so so we gave 
and now your the board is considering from based on what I've heard tonight that well we're going to take it away because of the passage of time that I don't think that was in the spirit of what happened back in 2004 and if this body doesn't wants developers to to hold true to their word the county should too and so it's you are you effectively or somebody that heard positions where you want to take away the school seats created by the donation of this land and give them to the benefit of another developer in the county. It's not right. It's not right. And so at, at, it's got nothing to do with the legalese of it. Well, but Mr. It, Mr. Wildrow, you might want to reconsider. You keep saying this board no, I'm is sorry. doing that. I, I didn't well, mean anybody here. I, I, that just, I take umbrage to that. Uh, You're saying this board, this sir, board, this I, board. You said, it, you said it, I think, four times. Okay. Well, You heard some things from some board members, but you didn't hear it from the board. Understand, and I okay. withdraw, I'll withdraw. i recharacterize the comments. Appreciate that. You're quite welcome. All right. So, I mean, the, But the point is we gave something, and it's not fair to take it away simply as a result of the passage of time and give the benefit to somebody else. Just not. Um, so and and <laughs> nobody can predict what's going to happen in, in 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 ten or twelve years. If if it turns out in an, in ten years we get to the point where we get to the last site plan and there aren't school seats available, then we'll have to address it at at that point in time. But the fact of the matter is, the crash is not necessarily coming. There are school seats there today. Create and by created in part by the by virtue of the gift this developer made to the Board of Education. I don't deny that at all. It would, you know, Mr. Knight made that donation, um, and I sure I'm sure he had expectation of um, of having seats available for the project. I don't know that he thought that the project was going to take a couple of decades, and. If, you, if we follow what you say, no matter what the numbers are in that school, you're saying you should have, a, you should have access to seats in that school, no matter, no matter how many there are and aren't. And that's not accurate. Look, look, a lot of school sites are given to the county. A lot of land's given to the county. I mean, you know, Piney Point Elementary School was donated land. I mean, they donated the land, they filled the school up, and as people and as other development came forward, you know, it's, it's, it's either you have adequacy or you don't. And here's my fear. You guys are going to do what you're going to do with regard to your phasing plan. Yes, sir. But, you, but you're going to be held with regard to if the county is going to fund a new school or if there's going to be a new school or there's going to be adequacy anywhere. Because the only way you're going to get adequacy here is you're going to have to start moving kids. <laughs> it, it, I'm, I, it's, it's right now, if this project is approved, as I understand it, given the reduction we had last time, right. the school seats are there. It's not my place, it's not my place to say phase one's good, phase two's okay, phase three, oh, no adequacy, whoever the person may be at that time, you're denied and that's where you stop. And I'm not asking you to say that. All I'm, if to the extent that there, there's a concern I've heard from members of the commission tonight that that you can, that that there's a crash crumbing, and you can't you can't comment on health, safety, and welfare because we can't even consider the school issue. Were the school issue before you? From my perspective, you got the equity argument, which I just raised with you, but also the numbers show under the standard that school sorts may be available. For, they are available today and may be available as, as the, as the uh, project proceeds forward. And to your point, if, if, if you're correct, then the developer is assuming the risk, because I'm not asking you to decide that there's a guarantee. They may get to the fifth phase, and the head of Lugan at the, at the time may say, sorry, no school seats, can't approve it. And it has to do not just with schools, it has to do with all of the elements of APF. It has to do with water and sewer. Well, I'll get to, I'll, well, that's I'm just coming, telling you, I, mean, I understand. 
I'm, you know, I'm not trying to get in your way. I'm just trying to, I'm a realist. I mean, I, I try to look a little bit further down, down the road, and it's not my job to lobby on behalf of someone that I think perhaps may make a mistake down the line. That's not my money. I mean, you want to do this, and you guys are good with that, then you're going to, have, you're going to do what you're going to do. I'm just trying, to, trying to, to express so that I feel better about myself that, that schools are an issue. Water and sewer can be an issue. You know, I mean, I'm just, and those are, those are things that are going to be required by you folks. I mean, there's only so many EDUs with regard to Metcom, and you guys aren't the only people on the table. It's, you know, I'm afraid of a jailbreak to, to EDUs. I mean, it's not a problem. Get yourself a check, stroke a check, and you can have all the EDUs you, you want. I, I mean, but you're not going to do that. Well, but, well, but wait a minute. Wait Maybe a minute. not going to do that. Wait a minute. You're right. They're not going to go out and spend all those money <clears throat> no. on, on, on EDUs today. However. Because they don't know if they have school seats. So they're not, they're not going to buy sewer if they don't have school seats. <laughs> However, today, as, or as, as we said last time, and, and I'll get with Mr. Um, Hauser, defer to the, to the commission on what you want to hear. I don't really want to go back over I'll all the testimony we did last time, because I think that's a waste of everybody's time. But it's a different hearing. So Mr. Hauser, I think, knows what kind of legal tenement I want. I've got to get the, the board's approval, I think, of allowing the testimony from the prior case be incorporated in this case because legally speaking there are two different things and i think that's the proper way to go about this if the planning commission so wants because the alternatives are to build our record for the case so that the planning commission one way or the other has evidence sufficient to base its vote upon tonight we got to have the evidence in the record that evidence has to be said or if we want to acknowledge that this is a continuation from the last meeting and that much of the facts and evidence and testimony germane to the concept site plan already came out through presentation question and answer during our consideration of the text amendment on the 27th that if we wanted to incorporate by reference all the testimony presented at that hearing into this one as long as mr chairman you think that is appropriate i think that is from a evidentiary and procedural viewpoint perfect way to go about it tonight rather than make mr wire and his client come up and go through the presentation of the same material and the same questions and answers as before. It's um, it's possibility if that's the way the board commission wants to go. Only problem I see with that is there might be some things that, uh, of course now this isn't the public's hearing, this is the applicant's hearing, but there might be some information that was missed by certain people in the last one. Um, that's gonna be a real, real fine thread there. Um, we will proceed. I mean, if we're going to answer, I'll defer to what you want to do. I mean, if we're going to ask you a question, we're going to ask you a question. You ought, you ought to pretty well know that about this board by now. Um, <laughs> I mean, if there's a question out there, it's going to get the. Can we can we allow everything? Yeah, I mean, we got a lot of information at the last hearing. Yes, yes, no. that, that can you. be taken. Now we might ask you to go. You know, I understand. Remind me what we said at the. You know, that type. That that. That part I get. So what I was about to do in response to Mr. Evans' just comment about water and sewer was remind you of what we told you the last time. And that is the first county body we came to see two years ago was METCOM. Um, water and sewer is an issue. We could go out and buy all the EDUs today. You're right. They're not going to do that. However, what they have been trying to do I mean, there are, and there are, we know there are already limitations in, in the system. Pump station issues, force main issues, and they have been trying to, as we indicated last time, they've been trying to coordinate what Met, METCOM already has on the books with what we're going to do. And as I told you, I think, we spent 12 months trying to evaluate um, the feasibility of a on-site system at METCOM's suggestion, mind you. They spent a fair amount of money getting it evaluated and certainly a lot of time, 12 months, and come to find out that system was almost three times as expensive as water and sewer that we were gonna install. So that didn't work. So now they're back at the drawing board. However, they have a, a system laid out that if they build it, as you'll see a diagram of it tonight, it'll have all the water and sewer capacity this project needs, regardless of how, uh, and not buying a single EDU, and regardless of what METCOM does. So from a may be available standpoint, 
this the 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 you can satisfy the water and sewer issue by just building it and obviously they don't want to do that they at the end of the day it's likely to be some combination of all of it but they are going to continue to work with metcom to tr to try and address it they already know they got to build a water tower and you'll you'll see that which is not going to be a cheap cheap endeavor and and as i said there's going to have to be upgrades to the pump station and force water main but they are working with metcom to do it they will get there you'll see a plan tonight that if they want to spend the money and install the system it's 100 percent themselves and satisfy all their um, water and sewer needs through that system, it can be done. It's just a matter of building it. And so the risk they're assuming is trying to coordinate those efforts with available EDUs and time it and so on and so forth. But that's a risk they're going to recognize and a risk they're willing to take. Yeah, and I mean, everybody's taking a certain risk. And you have other developers that are moving or will be moving forward, you know, that will consume their portion of EDUs that are available through Medcom. And Medcom. You know, Medcom, you know, has has a, a, a capacity at, of X at Marley Taylor. And to be honest with you, they operate at about 61 or 62 percent right now. Um, a lot of the EDUs are tied up by a, uh, by a couple of entities. How about that? So, and there's nothing we can do about that. They're not going to give them up. You're going to have to work with the, with the, the 61 or 62 percent that, that, that you have. Um, and just, you know, that's just an FYI. So if you have some, you know, build it and they will come. I think there was in a movie like that, Field of Dreams. <laughs> build it and they will and come. They came. Oh, and they came. Well, they did. They did. <laughs> Good luck. Good catch. Kind of like cornfield. I don't know. <laughs> well, it's not a cornfield, that's for sure. Um, all right. And then with respect to traffic, and I'll, I'll just to sort of give you a forecast, we have, and also on, on the timing issue, the school was donated in 2004. As I indicated to you last time, this project, notwithstanding what the public has seen of it, has not been on hold. It, it, it's in 2008 or nine, I came down here and met with Phil Shire, and it was after about this, about doing this project. And nobody was gonna build a project like this in 2008 in, in, in the Great Recession. The numbers just did not work. And I continued to talk to them, which like we said last time, in 2012, they submitted an, an updated traffic study as part of, of that ongoing effort. So it's not, it hasn't just sat and people's ignored it and all of a sudden we're showing up here 15 after, 20 years after the donation has made and saying, hello, remember us? We've been talking to the county the entirety of, 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 of the time and it just, for a variety of reasons, didn't make sense. We couldn't move the project forward. So it has not just sat with no activity at all, and we've showed up 20 years later and say, ah, we're demanding our rights. It's not, it's not what happened. Yeah, but the activity you're talking about, you contacted Lugum director or assistant director, whatever he was at the time. In 2008, everybody knew what the market was in 2008. You had no intentions of building it. And then in 2012, no, nothing was great and you did an updated traffic study, i.e. it just kind of looks like you just did that to say, well, we haven't abandoned the, the project yet, but you had no real intention of doing anything All at right. them times. Well, in, in, on, in on, real at, realism. On that note, if you, want, if you want me to raise my hand and swear, I'll tell you that I was the land manager at, 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 at Cheney at the time, and the notion that we had no intention of doing it, that's not absolutely correct. If you know the, the Cheneys by, or any developer, they don't spend money <coughs> willy-nilly just to keep something going on, and we were actively seeking builders in 2012, because in 2012, while the economy down here was perhaps not as better as it was further north, things were coming back out of after the crash in, in 2008. It took St. Mary's County longer to come back, but I can tell you I had direct conversations with a couple different builders about trying to convince them to come in. So it wasn't just some kind of subterfuge. I actively pursued and had negotiations with developers about trying to make this project work. Okay. So with respect to traffic, and this goes to Mr. Hauser's um, initial comments about um, the way this proceeding is going to unfold and, and retaining my rights um, to appeal um, and to contest the uh, manner in which we're, 
were proceeding. Typically, during a process like this, there would be an expression of concerns about things like APF and water and sewer and traffic. And the developer would offer solutions to <coughs> fully address those, some of those concerns. If I do that here, then arguably we've waived the right to say we shouldn't be here to begin with. So I find myself in the unfortunate position of not being able to address some of your concerns via a proffer. I don't think we really need proffers with water and sewer. We're just going to have to do it. But there have been a lot of um, concerns raised about traffic, particularly um, at the intersection of Bay Ridge and Five. And then a lot of concerns about the use of Bay Ridge Extended turning into a thoroughfare. Right. So th this, and what I'm about to say is without waiver to the rights on appeal, since our last hearing three weeks, a traffic expert who you'll hear from tonight has been talking to both State Highway and to DPW on ways to address some of the concerns which were raised by the commission as well as, well as the citizens. And for instance, one of the ways that you could cut down on through traffic across this, um, through this road is to turn it into a two lane road, which all from Bay Ridge up to the Carver. That's gonna take the county's um, approval, but it's, it, and then there are other, we considered some putting in stop signs, which is gonna slow people's desire, or desire to use this road as, as a cut through in addition to perhaps cutting it back to two lanes. And then there are some other traffic calming devices, but so we consider all that. Thank you. Thank we you. consider all that um, within the context in, of tonight, and you you hear about it. Look, they want to do a good project, and they want to address the concerns. They additionally have talked to State Highway and to DPW about uh, doing things on that shoulder at the entrance to Bay Ridge to ensure that one of the um, uh, residents of Bay Ridge who was here last time indicated that his wife was one of the unfortunate victims of getting whacked at, at that entrance because somebody jumped on the shoulder to go around them. You can solve that problem by sticking apparatus on the shoulders which prevent people from doing that. State Highway's not real excited about that, but they, I think they have said, and the expert will correct me if I'm wrong with a consultant, but they would consider allowing us to stick sort of an, um, an island and create a dedicated right turn lane, which will make it difficult for people to take that right hand to, to jump on the shoulder. So uh, there are a variety of things that we have considered in the past three weeks. Un unfortunately, just to give you a forecast, I'm not in a position to proffer those tonight for the legal reasons that, that Mr. Hauser and I both have, have, have given you all. Question for you on that. You had right. talked at the past hearing about the time, uh, you know, we're talking phases and basically the phases were a year. We were talking about that. 12 years to look for build out. So. <laughs> more or less a year, maybe a couple months shy. Um, how long would it be before you went through that housing development? You had said for a while that you would be feeding on the Great Mills Road and that you wouldn't be coming through that development right from the, uh, right from the beginning. Well, I, Mr. Dixon, if crap, I think actually the connection on Bay Ridge, I think at one point was on the, years ago when I was involved and it was actually, they were gonna, wanted to develop the south end, the end closest to Bay Ridge first. I think Mr. Dixon it, will tell you, if you want him to come up here, he can, that they've turned that on its head. They're gonna develop by Carver and move back to Bay Ridge. So they would not be connecting to, um, to five until much later in the project. Okay, that's what I wanted to hear. Now I also heard from some of our state delegates that this, this project to fix Great Mills Road in Route 5 is the funding's there due to start in 2025, which means it'll probably start in 2026 and then proceed from there by that time. Hopefully some of that problem will be fixed that goes down there. I haven't seen the drawings. I can't wait till they um, bring it to the public to show us exactly what they're gonna do with that. But um, 
if you're going to hold up a while, if you are going to do the north versus the south at the beginning, that would make this project a lot um, easier to swallow on on this on this board members part. Just knowing that one, they need to fix that Great Mills problem. It's been a problem for a while. It's been promised for a while. Now they're finally going. So they should, you know, and and I'm sure that they're going to do what they say because. You know, you can get elected in, but you can get elected out. Um, I'm sure this is going to be fixed, so that would help with that. Uh, I say toward the mid part of your uh, phasing program. Uh, I understand, and that the consultant, the traffic consultant you hear from, she, I believe, she has had conversations with State Highway, and I believe those projects are in the state plan. And then it's just ensuring that whatever they do feathers into whatever they want to do at the entrance of Bay Ridge and Five. So. Um, so, uh, in any event, um, I think I've addressed all the, oh, and by the way, let's, we have scaled by virtue of what was happened, happened at the last hearing. This project has been scaled back by almost a third and the open space has increased. So from that perspective, it's an improved, I mean, to the, to the extent that you, this body is concerned about APF and its impact on health, safety, and welfare and everything else, it is a much smaller product and, and its impact is, is gonna be lessened by virtue of what happened at, at the last hearing. And just to jump in on what you just said, sir, um, you mentioned earlier when you start your comments that uh, um, the applicant looked at the uh, uh, school situation and about how many seats were, and because of that, you reduced the amount of units you were going to make so that it wouldn't cause any problems. Is that correct? No. No? But, uh, okay. They, they reduced them for a different reason, but it had the impact that they lost okay. school seats. I believe some of Ms. Murray will correct me if I'm wrong. Okay. okay. But I believe they had, they lost lot units when they dug into the environmental further and they had to scale back because of that. Okay, okay. Not, so to get, not to get below the threshold. Okay, I understand, because from what we heard today, we don't have any say on the, the school component of this. So, okay, so it was more an environmental decision that kind of held your hand. I don't need to hear the details. I mean, we, we saw of our... No, I, but I believe that's what Ms. Murray testified to the last time she yeah, was here. Yeah, She got off easy the last time. <laughs> well, <laughs> I'm just so chatty I can't help myself. <laughs> All right. So could you explain? It's basically MDE who basically said because of wetlands and other sensitive areas that uh, the original development plan that was approved, um, the original PUD had to be scaled back to some some degree. Is that could you give us your name? Sorry. Hi, Allison Murray. Um, I'm here on behalf of the developer. Um, yes, so one of the comments that came through the TEC was regarding the buffers mm, and the wetland okay. buffers needing to be expanded given certain. And so it's a part of. Oh, oh dear. Uh, you got to watch them, Sorry, Jay. Paige, I shouldn't have cued it to you. <laughs> Whatever. I should have I'm slowed down. really loud. <laughs> we taped your wheels up. Um, and so as a part of trying to limit those Im wetland impacts, um, we scaled back and we lost some lots. We shifted things around. Also, knowing that we were close to the reevaluated school seats that were available um, and to address some of the concerns that we had received on the proximity to one of our adjacent property owners, we pulled those lots back as well and lost an additional four lots. So as a combination, being under and meeting the number of seats that are available as well as meeting our environmental impacts and reducing them to be as little if none as possible. I want you to have the opportunity to put that on the record today because uh, some people might have missed the earlier meeting and just from some of the many comments that we received through email um, over this past week, a, a number of them were concerned about the environment. And so, you know, um, yeah, I did notice that, that the, uh, because of their designation, there were certain areas that just weren't buildable. And so the, the scope or the scale of this project has been scaled back considerably from what it was originally uh, proposed or approved years ago. Yes, and we tried to scale it back so that there wouldn't be a, a variance required for those as well. Thank you. We, don't run away. <laughs> you thought you were getting ready to leave. Um, <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> one very far. I just, <laughs> just shift. <laughs> so um, after, I'm rereading a lot of this stuff the last couple of days, and in the comments from DPW, 
local DPW. Mm -hmm. And thinking back to when all this happened originally, because I can, um, there was there were some considerations that we we talked about at that time. There was always a concern about getting movements from Great Mills Road to <coughs> Willows Road, um, and that's in some comments. Um, <coughs> was that ever talked about? Ever brought up? Or was there an issue with? Uh, um, st uh, wetlands or anything like that? Do you know anything about that? Um, so as far as the connection with Willows, I don't think it was expected that we were making the connection. And what we discussed with DPW is that where the future connection could be made that we would extend either via easement or access or however it needed to happen, that it would extend along, I believe, the multifamily section and the pond. Yeah, and I wasn't and suggesting that you guys, I wasn't suggesting that you had proffered that, mm -hmm. but that's proper. The, so uh, I'm, I'm just saying that um, because at, at that time, back then, uh, the sheriff's office made comments, um, not so much negative, but they were looking for opportunities from to move from Great Mills Road to Willows. And with that construction of that road all the way back to, to uh, the, the elementary school, um, they thought there, there may be an opportunity for a connection to be made. I'm not saying that mm -hmm. you made it or would make it, but there would be an easement or some such thing if anyone down the line decided to to do that. I mean, we're going through situations now, you know, with 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 roads, you know, trying to acquire easements, mm -hmm. you know, trying to um, try, you know, trying to trying to get straight so we can build build a road, um, and it's better to do that, get an easement before you need it, as a, as mm -hmm. opposed into the middle of something. So that's why I bring it up. That's all. Uh, it's just, if I can interject for a minute, I'm, Mr. Gotch is here, or correct me if I'm wrong. As I understand it, the, the current status of conversations is is that that uh, Willows Road extended will sort of dead end in a cul-de-sac or something like that, and then it'll stop. And then conversations similar to what you just had. The problem for everybody is going to be, insofar as the actual construction of roads, you got to go through a lot of wetlands well, to make wetlands, it. There's a wetlands problem there. There's a wetlands problem on Peg Road, for example. And so that's not something you can make believe that, that mm -hmm. simply doesn't exist. Um, and because we would like to have a movement from Great Mills to, to Willows doesn't mean that that's that's where it would have to go or where it would go but it would be nice to find a place now, I understand like i said with mr Go we we recognize the issue and as as things move forward we expect that yeah, i mean we expect it can be addressed to the extent that we can address it right i mean i sit here i don't expect developers well not completely come in with you know an open checkbook policy i mean but we have an opportunity to make suggestions here mm -hmm. we can't require a thing I mean, not really, other than we you know what's before us with the comprehensive plan. And so it, your, your comments are correct. You know, you proffer something, that's terrific. Um, but beyond that, I use this word, it, it, it becomes extortion. We can't do that. We can't say we're more likely to vote for something if you give us something. We can't, we can't do that. But we can make you aware of things that we think are beneficial for the community. And that's why I bring up, I don't, that's why I brought the road up. That's all. Along those lines, before I get into the water sewer, I'm gonna reiterate something I said in the last hearing and isn't a waiver in this, and that's this. Right now, this PUD is not required to come through you on an annual basis, because that was not part of the original agreement. I proffered to you last time that they are willing to come in front of you on an annual basis to present you with an annual report and get advice and consent on how to make the project better and get input. That doesn't mean that they're gonna agree with everything that you might advise them to do, but they really honestly do wanna keep it a process. And I would hope that the proffer from the last one, just to be clear, not in this case, was that they are willing to do that if that's what this commission- Well, that, that's a like. good thing. Developers, developers inherently don't wanna do bad projects. I mean, they're only as good as their last project moving forward, and so, it's good that they want to come forward. You know, Wildwood does every year. You know, they come, it's pretty cut and dry. This is this is how many, this is what we built, this is how we built, this is what we're doing. We're, you know, we have open space. We, you know, they just give us a very brief overview 
um, once a once a year. It's not really a difficult process necessarily. No, it's not. Okay. Uh, Mr. Evans was asking about, you know, a, a potential connection to Wills Road. I'm just looking at the, the site plan that was the revised site plan. Could you direct me? I mean, I know there's no street names and stuff. Would that be like the sheet eight area where that would, would happen? Because I, I don't see any any um, space reserved where a future connection could, could happen. Ms. Murray's going to help Ms. Yeah. Brandy, okay. see if she can't find the right slide to show okay. you. Okay. I'm probably just what looking at the wrong section. You know, it's it's. Okay. <laughs> well, the only thing I know about it is is that it's going to dead end and it's going to be difficult to do anything to cross it. Beyond that, I yeah. can't tell you exactly where. Well, again, anything beyond your yeah. land is not your responsibility. But to provide that, that the county could eventually meet up with that, that would be uh, something that would make uh, good planning sense, essentially. Mr. Gotch may have a better sense of where it is. I'd hope so. Putting him, putting him on the spot. <laughs> Mr. Gotch. <laughs> you got to say Mr. Gotch for him to stand up. <laughs> so like here? Mm -hmm. So from here? Good evening, Mr. Gotch. Right. Want to tell us who you are? I'm Jim Gotch, <laughs> Director, Department of Public Works and Transportation. Uh, yes, we have requested a an extension of the road. There's a plan that's up. The road that comes up Bay Ridge comes by the large uh, pond. Mm -hmm. It was gravel pit. It will continue to go up to some townhouse areas. That is the road that's going that's going to be the ultimate connection to Willows Road if it ever gets connected. Okay. So, on the private side, you guys know I was on the private side, so probably within the last five years, we had worked on the property that was north of here. And also we're looking at that same road connection with that developer. Okay. So it's not this developer making the connection, but everybody who owns the property that goes. Yeah, right. I just brought it up because back when this was being done all those years ago, it came up about connections from Willows to, to Great Mills Road. So all the property owners have looked at it, just yeah. like Peg Road, Exactly. Uh, there's been dedications of Peg Road along the way, same thing. Right. right. So as long as the the the, uh, the phase doesn't build a, uh, a house in this potential future connection uh, right of way, then the county's okay. I mean, I'm not asking them to do anything other than that, just provide the uh, ability to potentially hook up in the future. Correct. We're asking for right of way extension to the property line and easements, construction easements, so we wouldn't have to go back and get a contemporary construction easement as well. Wonderful. And, and then uh, the road would stop at their uh, last point of access. Uh, you know, if we extend a road, what it's going to become is a dump at the end of the road. Exactly. Yeah. So what, what we would do is require the right of way, but not the road construction. I understand. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Thank Gosh. You. Thanks. Thank you. While you're talking about this area, you just, you brought it up, I did. Um, this is going on a little bit of a different subject, but we have one of the, I'll say the oldest sportsman clubs that's right up in that area where y'all are talking about this road. You don't you don't tend to impact this this um, establishment in any way with your housing. Uh, I mean, you wouldn't come up and say, well, we, we heard shots fired last night when they're having, you know, I'll say uh, turkey night or anything like that or, or whatever, you know. They, they, they have a shooting club there. Uh, they have been there since, I was a child, and that was not yesterday. Um, they've been there a long time. Uh, I would hope that there's going to be no impact or not, no problem with them continuing the sportsman club that they have, which is, is very well attended. We certainly have no intention of objecting to the on, those ongoing activities. I just wanted to, on, on, on the record. I don't think anybody record. in the back is hearing what you all yeah. are saying. Well, I'm, I'm right on top of this microphone, Mr. Uh, Brown. If I get any closer, I'm going to eat it. He was well, no, usually I'm, I'm so loud, people don't have okay, difficulty well, then get, hearing Okay, get, get loud and, and let them hear that back there. That's not volume, that's silence in it, so don't, don't, don't be plucking on that. 
Don't be messing Don't with Don't be messing with the equipment. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> Amy, Amy, Amy will take care I've of that. I've lost. I've, all right. So, no, we have absolutely no intention of, of, of uh, suggesting to anyone that the activities on the adjacent property cease. As I say, that's a very long time, well established uh, uh, a club. And uh, a lot of people go there. You know, there's not there, there's not another one. I don't think like that in the county. I guess uh, I have. Well, there is. There 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 are a couple others, but that for this area, long time membership in that club. So I'm I'm just trying to get you to say and what you just did that there will be no impact on that. Well, it, and and you know, Cheney was there for a long time running its plants, and from mm -hmm. from Cheney's perspective, Mr. Sander and his family were good neighbors. So, okay. I, Mr. Chairman, during the last meeting, I think I asked the question whether they had discussed anything with the Sanders Lake people, uh, and at that time they had not. I don't know if they've gone forward and talked to them now or not. I think there were some conversations before, but I don't, I'm not sure that they went anywhere. I think Mr. Dixon or Ms. Murray can speak to that, I so think. I had spoke with Mr. Sanner. Um, you have? I did, mm -hmm. and I, I heard his concerns um, in an attempt to uh, show good faith that we were hearing his concerns. We actually reduced that northern section and cut out four lots so that we could pull everything back so that there would be 100 feet between the property line and the closest property line internally so that that gives a um, sufficient space to provide some landscaping and provide a, a buffer through there. I would also hope that um, any lots that are sold there, it would be somewhere in that contract that says you are next door to a sportsman's club. You know, you, you, you may hear things. Uh, don't ne necessarily want you walking through the woods or anything like that, but <laughs> you have to warn an app, uh, a, um, somebody that's buying a lot there yeah. that they, uh, where, they, where they're at. We'll certainly that, speak with the that, builder on cause that. Because I, I still go back to being the six-year-old boy who likes to go find the woods and wander around in it. <laughs> and to me, that adequate fencing or whatever it takes to kind of keep those six-year-olds from going over there. Mm -hmm. that, that, I know we've that would all be done all's it. responsibility. That's not their responsibility. That would be y'all's responsibility to, to however, however you come about it. And that would be part of uh, APF, I suppose, because that's safety. So you would have to come up with, a, with an adequate way to uh, prevent people from walking on site to that, to that club. Certainly look at options there. Okay, thank you. I have a question about the first phase of this project. Is the first phase single family homes, multifamily homes? Do we know? Have you made a decision? The phases are designed to provide a breakdown of all model options. So both the, the um, Mr. Dixon reviewed, there's two separate lines of homes <coughs> that the builder is offering. And within one, there's two townhouses and a single family. And then in the other line, there's two model, there's two t townhouse models and a single family, a larger single family. And the goal short of, I think the last phase is there are availability of lots for every single one within each phase so that it's not just singles being built. It's not just towns being built. The products are all available across each phase. Okay. So there will be apartment buildings in phase one. Oh, um, excuse me. No, not in the apartments. They would potentially be a different phase. We haven't decided okay, that's, when that's those would be. I apologize. Job. I thought you meant yeah. within the singles and towns. So you're not going to start with apartments? It's not the intention, no. Anybody else have a question or oh, so far as where we've gotten? Just to uh, refresh our memories, I want to have Mr. Dixon come up and tell us how things might come about. Sure, I'll, Mr. Dixon can come up and then not that I'm, Ms. Murray back up to I'm, do. Or Ms. Murray can do it, I didn't mean, I'm not shortchanging you. More familiar, I think, with that aspect of it than okay. Ms. Murray is. Thank you. Good evening, sir. John Dixon, representing the developer. Okay. Would you like to explain to us uh, just an outline of how, how you're going to go about things. What, what, what are you going to build first? So it, it's, a, it's a range of houses, as um, 
Ms. Murray just stated, they've got two distinct prop, um, product lines to hit different price points. And within each of those product lines, they have two different types of townhouses, two different types, uh, or actually one type of single family home size-wise uh, within each. And the community is being designed so that we provide each of those range of products in each of the phases. And so the first phase will have 18 foot townhouses, 20 foot townhouses, 22 foot townhouses. It'll have 40 foot wide single family houses. It'll have 50 foot wide single family houses. And that will continue on through the project. The multifamily component up adjacent to the commercial area will be done in the future. We don't see that as, as there being demand for that early in the project. If somebody comes along and wants to do a multifamily project there, and then we'll, you know, we'll work with them, but that's not intended to be the, in, in the first phase of the project. Okay. So, Mr. let me ask, so right now the only aspect of this that is currently under contract from a, from a builder standpoint are the townhomes and the single families and there's no contract for the construction of an apartment building. That is correct. Are you actively seeking that? I am not. I am not. But none of the phases are limited to what you could ask for. Like phase one is not strictly limited by the PUD documents to say we can only build 50 townhouses. No, no, the, the PUD document is flexible along those lines. We're doing it because we think it's important for the success of the community to keep momentum going and to, have, to be able to hit each of the demand segments of the, uh, the buyer population. So in answer to your question is we are focusing on the for sale product in the community initially. We think the demand from a, you know, an apartment developer um, perspective comes when there is, when there are the commercial uses, the retail uses there, the restaurants, the shops and such. Um, that buyer, that renter tends to be interested in lifestyle amenities that are, are gonna be offered in, in, the, in, the, uh, in, the, in the commercial complex. And they kind I think they go hand in hand. As part of your first phase, when do the, shall we say, I take it the streets really aren't final pave, it's just a, the preliminary, is the sidewalks and all that, and lighting put in as you put, go through that phase? Yeah, each phase will, all, the sidewalks go in with, Sidewalks that are along open space, we put in as part of the street construction. Yeah. The sidewalks fronting the homes are put in as the homes are built. Because if I put them in and then they build the house, the sidewalks get destroyed by the, by the construction equipment, by the builder. Yeah. So all of that goes in. The, uh, the street lights go in when the electric is run. So they will go in just as people are moving in to to those for each phase. Okay. Now with the street lights, have you noted the comments from the Navy as far as what their concern was? Yeah, absolutely. They, 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 they don't, first of all, they, they, they will have a canopy on the top so that the light will not be directed up. And generally they are safety lights. They're not high intensity lights. They're, they're spaced, you know, every 50 to 75 feet along the road so that the foot candle overlaps slightly, but doesn't spill over and generate um, either nuisance for neighbors, light, you know, too much light, or create security issues for overhead traffic. I guess to continue along some of these questions, the pathways to the respective schools, that was also a point that was made by an hate to mention that term, the school system, but I was just wondering whether you would put that in your in thought process. Uh, we are giving that consideration. 
Okay. Now, will the sidewalks be extended down? Will you all be moving down? What is it, the name of the road? Bay Ridge. Bay Ridge, as, all as, the way as, down as, as far as, because yeah. there's no sidewalks really along there. There are there are not. So we, we can't impact what's what's already existing within the Bay Ridge community. But as we build Bay Ridge Avenue, the sidewalks will be it built will with have the road. It, but they won't. That would be up to the county to correct to correct. impose that. So we will build them up to that connection into that community and then the county can figure out how to, you know, extend them down. Because that's one of the issues that's been brought up is if it was an alternate traffic pattern, then where do you find the sidewalks for people going down between those two developments? What you're really saying, if I hear you right, is one's the county and we will connect to that or bring it down to where or it we'll be. run it to a point and then the county will connect to it. That, that's, that's up to, to Mr. Gotch. And his quick question for Mr. Gotch. You must. I know you. I knew. I know you knew. I was going to ask you this. Yeah. I mean, I can see it on when I looked your way. You kept looking over that way. Um, is that the county's responsibility to build those sidewalks, or would the homeowners association have to build that sidewalk down Bay Ridge? Could be either. It could be either. So uh, could be either or a combination thereof. Yes. So <laughs> we are. We don't have. We don't know where every sidewalk in the county is right now. We are actively going out and locating sidewalks and putting them into the GIS system as we speak every day. So the, the goal is to figure out where our sidewalks are first. And then uh, we're in the, we're making notes for the next road ordinance change. Mm -hmm. And uh, when we get into the urban areas, it's time to do away with the open section roadways and start creating curb and gutter with sidewalks. Yep. So that's where we're headed. But at this time, if they extend the sidewalk down to the property to what's the existing Bay Ridge, then I think it would be on us to make a connection down to Route 5, but there's no sidewalks on Route 5 yet either. No, so. hopefully the state will do that when they do their thing <laughs> they should have plans yet yeah, well. the plans don't exist they're just funded right now so 2025 i believe is when they start the design and they carry two lanes through uh, route five all the way up to indian bridge road okay. is there space in bay ridge you know from where they built the houses out to where the existing road is now when they connect to even put sidewalks there's a wide uh, right away through there right now. Okay. So, so the question becomes, how do you create a walking path separate from the shoulder? If, if you think about Wildwood, you've got everybody walking on the shoulder. And uh, is that the safest thing? No, in the 1970s or 80s when Wildwood was going, that's what was done. Um, today, I think you want the separation from the pedestrians, from the cars. That's where we're headed. So what, hap what has to happen in Bay Ridge, the existing subdivision? I don't know. We'll solve that problem sometime down the road. But, you know, it's, it's all funding based on uh, what we get from the commissioners for construction. Does um, Stewart's grant in the end result have a sidewalk that parallels Bay Ridge Road from one end to the other? Yes. Okay. And I think, the, if I re remember, the Board of Education, Kim, how uh, proffered help with regard to how that path might be, how a path might be laid out, a walkable uh, possibility between uh, housing and the schools. I think I'm, it's in the it's in a document. I think she proffered that some help in, in that regard. I mean, without making a proffer. It was a topic of conversation at the last hearing, and they yeah. indicated at the last hearing that they would that be they glad may. to I talk to the board about it. it. I mean, it makes sense. People are going to, I would think people are going to, who move into the neighborhood are going to say, well, you got three schools there. It's one of the attractions of coming there. How are my kids going to get there? Yeah. And I would presume that from a sales standpoint, having a sidewalk that goes to the school will help sell the house. Right. So. Mm -hmm. Mr. Dixon, 
Um, so I'm looking at the bubble plan. I'm trying to get out. <laughs> um, Thank you, Mr. Don't Gotch. Go, don't go nowhere. Eventually, I want to get a question at him. <laughs> So I'm just looking at the bubble plan here, and I know this is just you know a, a very grand, you know, big concept site plan here. But um, I see a community center um, uh, identified, and I see the park area. Um, is each neighborhood going to have their own recreational uh, facilities for children, or are the 1,100 units um, all going to be just using a single? Uh, you know, community building or or you know, central like one 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 like swing set essentially. Well, first of all, it's one neighborhood, so there it is in phases, but it's one neighborhood, and the pool and clubhouse will serve all of the neighborhood, just as that main open space that'll probably be ball field, dog park, that sort of thing. We will likely have numerous tot lots spread throughout the community. Whether there will be one in each and every phase, I can't guarantee that right now, um, but there will be amenities spread throughout the community for, you know, the, for tot lots for the most, most part. That ball field area, that a big open space is pretty centrally located within the community. Okay. Um, the clubhouse is, is noted, it is cited where it is because it overlooks the lake and we think that's gonna be a really nice setting for the, the main you know, uh, recreation feature of the community. Um, plus, it's awfully nice when you're driving in, coming in um, Carver Road and looking at it, it's a, it's a, it's a nice focal point sure. and draws you to that as well as the lake that we're you know, retaining as a central feature within the community. Yeah, I'm glad to hear that because I live in the uh, Cedar Cove uh, PUD that was done many years ago, and some of our neighborhoods do have um, playgrounds. Um, other neighborhoods do not. I mean, uh, when I look at this and I look at the bubble diagram and how you've identified them by different colors, you know, I, I, I personally count four or five different neighborhoods. Um, you know, let's not get into the language and definitions, but uh, I'm, I'm glad to hear what you said, that they would be distributed throughout, that you're not expecting a toddler, for example, to be going down, um, you know, half a mile down Bay Ridge to, to go to the community well, center. Plus to, one tot lot is not gonna serve 1,100 yeah, units. Uh, yeah, I'm glad to hear that, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Piggybacking on that, when they were talk, just talking about the um, open space, um, I know it's, pretty much says what it is, open space. But have you talked with uh, Parks and Recreation, um, Mr. Shepard from Parks and Recreation, are there gonna be any like baseball type facilities or anything in that? I have not had a discussion with Parks and Recreation yet. You should um, talk to Mr. Shepard then. We'll, we'll be would, happy to. He'd be, and he'd be happy to hear that from you. Um, any ball fields in the county, I mean, that's a big thing here in the county, uh, youth baseball used a lot. Um, I'm sure we'd like to have a talk with you on that. Yeah, well, we, we can certainly discuss that. Okay. I almost forgot my question. <laughs> the main one, you hit my you arm. Wake you me up here. Um, we, we were discussing who's going to do uh, policing, um, if they're blocking traffic in the neighborhoods. Um, my question's always been, is the county going to take over the roads that are eventually take over the roads in the development? Uh, and if so, does the sheriff department, will they be responsible for cars parking in the wrong directions and obstructions and stuff like that? Okay, for, for roads, uh, the county owns and maintains roads that are in single family lots. Okay. When you get to the townhouses, if it's a garage townhouse unit or even parking bays, uh, most of the time they're private. Uh, any any time the you get into an apartment complex, it's all private. So the county would own most of the single family road, most of the feeder roads, collector roads, that sort of thing, will own, and we will maintain them once we accept them into the system. As far as parking, the the road ordinance has parking standards. If if the, if you have a narrow roadway. Um, you can park on it, but you can't park opposite each other. 
we were we had a case like that uh, probably a year ago in front of the commissioners about whether we wanted to impose no parking on private or on um, public roadways and the answer is we don't we don't want to mark roads as non-parking roads major collectors by our ordinance you can't park on them so if you've got a major collector like bay ridge could be a major collector coming up um, no parking on that road is appropriate but you don't have houses accessing that road they're all on internal roads and then those roads come out and tee into bay ridge so i think the answer to your second question huh. is is that the enforcement of safety issues, whether it's parking or, or speeding or whatever, on the public roads, that's the county through DPW and T. And on the internal roads for the townhouse communities, um, that's gonna be on the HOA and the residents to maintain and to enforce the rules and regulations that are enumerated within the Declaration of Covenants for the community. Here comes our man. Uh -oh. <laughs> that, that leads me to another subject, and you know where I'm coming now. Snow removal, that means you, the county takes care of the county roads and the HOA has to worry about where the townhouses are? Correct. That is correct. Whoa. That goes on now in Wildwood. That, 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 that's every, every community we develop, and it's not a problem. It's not just you, it's a lot of them. Yeah. 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 Everybody does. Unless you're the owner of the land, of the townhouse, and then, then there's a problem. No. Well, actually, <laughs> I'll tell you. They on, probably on, clean on, faster than the county. It, it, I know. They, get them done, they, they get it done quicker than the county does mm -hmm. because a residential street is not as high a priority as, as a major thoroughfare, you know, to a municipal, you know, decision matrix. You gonna take that, Mr. Gotch? Uh, you know, <laughs> we have a great snow removal policy down there. Just, there you go. That's it worked I great this year. <laughs> he inherited can, a very good one. Can we go to Can we go to Mr. Hauser? Um, I think he has to make my seats up here yeah. okay. for about a minute now. Um, okay. I just came up. Uh, the question regarding uh, sheriff's office enforcement of speeding and parking on public roads and private roads. Transportation article says that sheriff's office has authority over any public highway. That would include a state-owned facility. When it comes to private roads, though, unless you are in Culver County, um, it is left to the sheriff's office authority would not extend to a uh, road owned by a community association or a homeowners association or a similar entity. So I, I agree with Mr. Dixon. Anything on Bay Ridge or a road owned by the county is fair game, but enforcement for the houses within the subdivision that stay under private ownership uh, would have to be privately enforced, towing companies, whatever mechanisms the HOA would want to use. I just want to make sure that was on record so Thanks. that no one has confusion as to who has what responsibility. That was all. I'd like to throw my Thanks, two cents John. in about the, that whole responsibility thing. So I live at the Villas at Cedar Cove, which is the last, uh, one of the last developments. It's a townhouse development at the end of Long Lane uh, by Gate 3, which was one of the Cedar Cove uh, PUDs. And uh, we have a huge problem with parking there. The developer did not put enough parking in. Uh, most of the, our residents uh, work on base. Uh, they move every couple of years. Their garages are basically uh, the stuff they haven't unpacked from their last move. So they have a one-car uh, driveway, and then any other vehicles for their, for their townhouse uh, have to go in overflow there's not enough overflow parking. And so therefore people are parking in the private right of way um, and to the point where like I have trouble getting my truck out of my own driveway if somebody parks directly opposite. Our HOA did put some signs up and said they, that people would be towed by private, um, a tow, tow vehicle, but there's a limit to what HOAs have in terms of teeth and, and, and power and my concerns are, especially with so many townhouses, is if you leave it up to the HOA, um, things are not gonna be done and people are gonna be living in unsafe conditions. I would say you know, to the county and publicly that I live in a very unsafe condition, that if there was a fire at the end of my street, I don't think our equipment 
you know, the rescue squads could get their equipment down there because so many of our people are parking in the street. And they're not doing it out of laziness. They're doing it because there's lack of parking. Um, and one car garages and, and one um, spot driveways um, are, are clearly not enough when, you know, a three bedroom townhouse could easily have four. Uh, 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 cars, uh, and that doesn't ca even account for uh, graduations. Oh, come, come, come! You know, high school graduations in June. You know, people are triple parking, and and uh, I mean, it's it's, it's ridiculous. Uh, they're parking all the, uh, uh, down uh, Long Lane and stuff. So, um, yeah, I don't know really how to address this at this particular instance, but. Um, I'm hoping that at least when, when the phases come in to lug them and they're reviewing these things, since it's not going to come back to us, that, that my words tonight are being heard. Um, you know, I'm looking at a sketch, you know, and I see a bunch of houses. It's, it's, it's preliminary, so I understand it's not going to be detailed, but I don't see anything on there that shows any kind of overflow parking. And from our own example and learning from our own mistakes, um, you know, townhouses generate a lot more parking and whatever the rules are right now for the county, um, they're inadequate. And we have friends who live also, um, um, in Wildwood, in the townhouses, and the same thing. Um, the, the cartways uh, in the townhome sections are very narrow, um, and most of, of the people that my wife work with, um, they're parking in the street when they have a guest, and it's very hard for another vehicle to get past, a, per a passenger vehicle, let alone a rescue squad or you know some type of heavy equipment from the fire. Um, so, <coughs> you know, I, I'm glad to hear that you know for single family. And for the, the major arterials uh, like Bay Ridge Road, the county's going to take that. But I think maybe, and I'm not really sure, Mr. Gotcha, it's in your, your um, you know, uh, uh, responsibilities or it was with Lugum, but somebody needs to take a look at this um, just to make sure that, um, that when these townhouses are built, that there is adequate parking for modern standards in 2023. Well, one thing you, you should consider as a board then is there's a penalty to the developer for building more parking spaces than, are, than is required. So it, it requires additional landscaping. And, and, and you could remove that penalty Yeah. if you wanted additional parking. Yeah, and, and that's just a concern, but, but we're not going to hear this again when they come to, to build these various phases. So... You know what is, what what? <laughs> I guess I'm struggling with what what do we what can we say today about that? Because on the other hand, you don't want to have too much impervious surface because we're at the Chesapeake Bay watershed and we want to minimize runoff to the to the to the watershed. But at the same time, you know, it seems like the way that the code is in place in this county, townhomes are not putting enough. I mean, builders are going to put what they're allowed to do. They're not going to break the rules. They're going to they, if the county says build so many spots per per unit, they're doing it. But somewhere along the lines of the the you know the the need versus what's being built is is way off. Well, most of the puds that were developed at the time, including Wildwood, was uh, two and a half spaces per townhouse. Mm. One in the garage, one in the driveway, and a half a space for the overflow. And what you're saying is true. There's a lot of garages that don't have cars in them. So now you've got two and a half cars where you've got one in the driveway and then one and a half looking for a parking space in the development. Right. Either in the overflow or on the street. That's that's what's happened. And I think I think maybe the, the, the two and a half cars uh, per townhouse might be a good national unit, especially in terms of planning and, and, and standards. But I think uh, we're unique because our number one employer in the county is the base. And there are a lot of people who are very transient. They, they spend very few, you know, few, a year or two, and then they get relocated to another uh, facility. And so I think in our particular circumstance, I think we need to ac accommodate or address the concerns that most of these people who are moving don't end up unboxing everything because they're only here for a two-year stint before they get moved on to another base another uh, assignment I'm, I'm not really sure I'm, I'm looking at you but it's not it's not yours to, you know problem to resolve I guess I'm just airing my um, my frustrations to the Can I answer a question to mr. Brown too typically for for traffic enforcement public works gets a call that says they're speeding on my road can you do a traffic study 
So we put out, it's not cameras, but we put out devices that, that measure how many cars and the speed they're going and actually the time that the cars are speeding. So if, if there is excessive speeding on the roadway, usually about five miles an hour or more over the posted speed limit, we send a letter to the sheriff and tell them, here's the time that most of the speeding occurs if you would like to go enforce it. I don't know why you're targeting that at me, but well, you had there, there are a lot of questions about another road in the county that happens. I find that very interesting. I, I su I've suggested to people they contact the sheriff's office directly, but your point is well taken. You collect the data to support the justification. Every week, we have three sets of, of uh, speed devices and they're out almost continuously. Okay, well, it's nice to know. And I hope the public understands that too. Except a state highway. Well, <laughs> except the state highways. <laughs> we don't I found that one out. <laughs> they have their own equipment, so. Yeah. They're, they can, you know, you can get in touch with the state just like us. But it's also right. important to note for this project because Great Mills Road is a state highway, correct? As well as Route 5, yes. Goes Route 5, okay. <coughs> Thank you. Well, we'd like to take a uh, recess now. Escape. Seems like we got a little pause in the action. How about if we take about a five minute ish recess?
Oh, he is something. Doesn't matter. We want to Okay, we're back in the session. During recess, um, I asked the applicant uh, what, what more we're, we're going through tonight. You all know what's getting ready, what I'm getting ready to say, but I always like to let you know as soon as possible. We, we still have well over an hour, hour and a half, possibly two hours of work to do just with the applicant on traffic, sewage, um, all other matters that are going to come with this. I'm not going to be able to get in through public testimony tonight. So I'm going to give. I'm going to let you know right now that we're going to hear probably we're going to hear the applicant up till 10 o'clock, but we're probably going to have to continue. Our continued date is going to be May 15th, and I will have public testimony then. Uh, I am sorry that it goes this way, but um, we. This is the only way I, I know how to do it. I can't even if we were to get the applicant his hour and then start on public testimony, I would not be able to get all the public testimony and with the amount of people that have written down on the sheet and whoever else might come in, if I give you just strictly your three minutes, which sometimes get, is flexible, um, we wouldn't be able to get it in. So I just want... We always listen to the public. Some of our decisions we have changed. Okay, what are you? Uh, hey, hold on. I can't. I can't have you calling out. I need you to come up to the microphone, and I'm not going to swear you in. You're asking a question, just about test, just about testimony. I'm not going to give you know. It's not going to be information either way, except for you understand that. I don't do this often, but you know, I've got a lot of people sitting out here. Ms. Mathis, I can't have you just call out from the audience. And I'm not gonna start having everybody come up and ask me a question. I, I can let you know that. This question is just is just in reference to the meeting on May 15th. Yes. Will the input given on that day give enough time for the county to take that into account when they make their decision decisions? I gotta say, well, okay. Give me another word, sir. I don't quite understand that. Um, the public testimony, we're going to hear everything. And if you do miss something, if you decide to get up tonight, this this what hearing. What I'm trying to avoid is that the public testimony is given, and then like a, two days later, they make their decisions without even taking it into account. After public testimony, we're the ones that make the decision. Yeah. The we're the decision and makers when, on when that. If, I'm just saying, if either way, then it would be up to the applicant because of what our decision would be. They have to go to land use and growth management. Then they have to work out the adequate public facilities. Then they would be able to either, either they won't do that or they will do that and then it's up to land use to tell them who, what, where, why, and how. But we will take all of the public testimony Always. into account before a decision is made. Okay. We've so, made some of our best decisions because of what the public has said during public testimony. There's things that you may know that did not come up tonight. And uh, of course, the applicant always has the right to rebuttal after that and, and, and to go through things and, and to ask you a question. The board can ask you a question and, and he can ask you a question while you're up there giving that testimony. That's when some of the best beat, best meat comes out is during that time. Don't give up on us, but yeah, no, I've been assigned to, I've been assigned to do these meetings, you know, in a specific way. I haven't wavered over the years. Um, do I get complaints every now and then? I have people that would really not have come tonight if they didn't know that. Uh, but I can't predict that. I can't predict how fast they're going to go. Now that I know what they're doing, we kind of can predict it to a to a degree. Okay. I got to hear from the public before we do it. We're not going to make a, any type of decision until we hear from the public, no matter how long it takes. Okay. Cases like this sometimes go on. I don't want to say another one after this, but you know they go on sometimes two or three meetings. And it's just that it's it's the way it is. Mr. So. Chairman, I personally okay that answers want question. to hear from the public. Yeah. Okay. And each uh, each member up here wants to hear from the public. And I know there's some people that might have gotten up and they're, they're, they're mad at this point. If they're mad with me, that's what I'm up here for. We volunteer for the, for the madness to come our way. But, yeah. but we're going to do it right, I can tell you. It's both for this applicant because this is his thing and for you because you live or because you're the part of the public that we're working for. 
Yeah. And okay. I'm going to be leaving, but don't think that as anger. It's just because I have to get up for work. I understand. That's why I'm saying this. Hey, if you can get, hey, I get up at 430. If I thought I could get an extra hour, I'd be going on down the road. But uh, Ms. Mathis. All right. Thank you. Uh, please don't ask me any questions about the cases he, either here or there. If you want to know something about how we're going to go forth. I just have a request that it might be good for the next meeting. Yes, ma'am. To let the public go first. Well, while I was sitting here mm -hmm. and on my notes, mm -hmm. you all would be very surprised, I think, about the topics I pulled out in my head mm -hmm. that complemented what just about everybody was saying. Well, so I think that if you have the benefit of that, as you are progressing toward your conclusion, it might be wonderful. Okay, Ms. Mathis, I got all respect in the world for you, but I've been doing these hearings for more of the years than I really want to count, and I've always done it this way. This is how our, our, our um, standard operating procedures go. Um, there are people in this office, I mean in this office, in this audience, that have been through this with this board many times. Um, some of them can tell you this is, this is just how it goes. This, this is our procedure. The applicant finishes up his, then we hear the public testimony. That gives, then that gives the uh, right for the applicant and the board to ask questions. And I'm just using you as an example. Ms. A Ms. Mathis just came up and told us how to completely fix that road, which would be a beautiful thing. <laughs> and uh, the applicant would then ask you some questions. We would ask you some questions. We write that information down and then we take it to the end. And then uh, after he does his rebuttal or they do their rebuttal, then, uh, then the board gets together and, and we make a decision. But that, that's, that's the process that we do. I'd love to, I would love to let the public go tonight right now. But if I did that, then you wouldn't hear what he's gonna say for the rest of the evening. And then I'd have to bring you back again, just so you could, re you could ask questions on whatever he, you, know, you missed that he's gonna do <clears throat> after I let y'all talk tonight. So I'm in the corner for y'all. Hey, y'all live in the county, they, not saying anything bad. They don't live in the county, you live in the county. I wanna make sure that I hear everything that a, that a county citizen says. Excuse me? No. Yes, ma'am. And and like I say, if you miss any of this tonight on Channel 95, um, or YouTube, I'm not or YouTube. You can go right to YouTube anytime, right. put it and pop it up and watch the rest of the meeting. I'm just just giving you alternatives, okay? How you doing, Mr. Dixon? <laughs> okay, Mr. Wyrow. Did you get all that? <laughs> Uh, I, I, I like to take. I, hope so. I like to take care of our people here. You uh, know, that's uh, that's that's the driving force uh, for, for I, most I, of what I, I do in this board too. I understand, and and wow, um, I don't reside in the county. I do reside just across the river. <laughs> and, I'm just teasing. And, well, I'm well. I'm just, well I want to make a in. point and. And as I said last time, Cheney's been in St. Mary's County for a long time, and they are an integral part of this project, and they're going to be in Southern Maryland for a long time as well. So they have a vested interest in ensuring this project is done properly, as Mr. Dixon has also expressed. To your last points, Mr. Fazekas, I just want to reiterate that we, one, if you may recall, one of the um, topics of the minor amendments requested at the last hearing related to parking, and I believe Mr. Dixon ended that particularly with respect to the townhomes, and not sure how they handle it in your um, subdivision, but if, and he'll correct me if I, if I get this wrong, there are going to be overflow parking areas within each townhouse section that they intend to build. Now, I can't tell you how many they are, whether or not it fits your concerns, but okay, they, that's good. It, it is within the need for additional parking is in, in the planning stage. That, that's good to hear because I didn't see it on the, on the, the concept site plan, but no, I'm glad, but the, I'm glad, I'm glad it's for the record. Thank yeah, you. that, and we did just so the record's clear that testimony was from the last hearing. And, and so, um, and I assume I stated it accurately, otherwise he'd have corrected me. Um, okay, with that, I'm gonna bring Ms. Murray back up to talk to you. Uh, 
All right, Ms. Murray, could you remind the commission what your role and responsibilities are with respect to this project? So working with the developer, I am helping with design, permits, entitlements, um, the design aspects, as well as you know, once construction runs into play, I will be overseeing construction as well. All right, and you by, by training you are an engineer, is that correct? Yes. Any particular specialty, is it a civil engineer? Civil engineer. Okay, and in addition to your, the responsibilities just you just described, you have specific responsibilities with respect to the engineering firm or firms which the uh, development team has retained? Yes. And could you describe those responsibilities briefly for the commission? So our, we are working with Dewberry and we have engaged them to review the water and sewer capacity, the needs that our subdivision will have, what the existing conditions are, and how those two align and what we will need to do in order to meet those conditions. Okay, and you've heard me represent to the board earlier that, that and I don't wanna reiterate all the testimony, but who, who was the first county agency that the development team contacted when they decided to do this project? Metcom. All right, and could you briefly describe for the commission the, how those conversations unfolded since their inception? From the start, we have been open. We have shared our concept plans, our layouts, our um, number of residential units that we are proposing and discussed what the county has, what the local pump station has, where we would be feeding both sewer as well as what the current water uh, capacity is and throughout the time we met with them there were shortages from a sewer standpoint and Metcom actually offered up reviewing which Mr. Wyro mentioned an on-site facility. We underwent a fairly thorough review of what that would take um, from a design standpoint a sizing a capacity for the drain fields um, a disbursement for actual drip fields so they could actually water some of the grass fields, the ballparks, um, and reached out to various contractors for approximate costs, and it was not deemed feasible by any means. So we returned back to Metcom with the conclusions that we found as well as continuing options for returning back to a pump station on site that would feed into the force main system and run to Marley Taylor, which is where we have landed today. Okay, and um, the, what, what is currently up on the screen, could you briefly tell the commission what that depicts, that plan? I am going to move the mic so I can look at the screen. <laughs> okay. So currently what you see here is a, a subdivision within Stortz Grant and what we are proposing is, and the exact location will be determined at, final, at design time, um, but as a part of phase one, we would provide a pump station that our lots would gravity drain to and then we would also have to build a force main that would run down George Carver and down Great Mills Road and tie into at Shangri-La to be treated by the existing Marley Taylor treatment facility. Um, as far as a little more detail, I'm actually going to read you. So our engineer who we've been working with was unable to attend tonight, so we had him write something up. So I'm going to be rude for a minute and just read from my phone, but just so that I don't put words in his mouth. Dewberry Engineers Inc. Is in, is in cooperation with St. Mary's County Metropolitan Commission, METCOM, has evaluated the public water and sewer systems to access, to assess the capacity available and they identify additional system improvements needed to serve the proposed Stortz Grant development. As far as EDUs, the anticipated number of EDUs needed to serve Stortz Grant were calculated using the current phasing plan, which includes 1,122 residential units, a clubhouse with a pool, and supporting commercial development, and in accordance with the METCOM design manual updated May 20, 2022. Based on this information, the maximum number of EDUs needed to serve Stortz Grant anticipated to be, is anticipated to be less than 1,133. 
As of today, METCOM has indicated adequate water supply and wastewater treatment capacity is available with the following improvements needed to support the Storts Grant development. For water, based on the projected demands, the Storts Grant development will construct an elevated storage tank to meet the projected water demand and meet fire suppression requirements set forth by METCOM and St. Mary's County. Storts Grant LLC will continue to work with METCOM through the planning and design process to locate the tank at an optimal site and size all water mains through the development to meet regulatory requirements. For sewer, additionally, the Storts Grant development will construct all on-site gravity sewers needed to collect and convey wastewater generated by the new residential and commercial customers to the existing gravity sewer or proposed central wastewater pumping station. The pumping station will be sized in accordance with METCOM's design manual and best engineering practices to meet all current regulatory requirements. The wastewater force main will be routed through the development to the Great Mills, Cord Great Mills Road corridor. All wastewater will ultimately be treated by METCOM at the Marley, Tater, Marley Taylor Water Reclamation Facility. All right. So in the um, diagram, there's something that looks like a blue diamond or a blue square um, to the left of Bay Ridge. What is that? So that was a uh, first round review from an elevation standpoint. Um, as a potential option to propose a water tower location. There are several locations around the site that we are reviewing, but that would be determined once we get into the actual design phase as far as what's needed, the space that METCOM is going to require, um, the elevation, the access for optimal design. Okay, and what do you want? Why is elevation a um, consideration in, for an optimal design associated with the water tower? Ideally, you want your water tower your, at the highest elevation. It just helps to reduce the height of your ta of your tower. Okay. And the uh, square that's in lime green uh, to the right of the proposed location for the water tower, what is that? Currently, that's where we are proposing a pump station that would also be built within phase one based on requirements and capacity available. Um, it provides the location that would allow us to gravity all of the site too, if needed. All right, and do you have an understanding, so far as the line that you're contemplating installing in Great Mills Road, do you have an understanding as to whether or not that um, line would create, <coughs> excuse me, excess capacity for METCOM to uh, contemplate other developments in other locations in the area? It could, yes. So our engineer has been discussing with METCOM as well as the engineer that they are working with for their pump station upgrades. And we would continue to work with METCOM on the best option for moving forward for what we need as well as any additional capacity for their needs. And, and, and in connection with that, do you have an understanding as to what METCOM cur currently is contemplating from a capital improvement standpoint in this area? For the pump station, I, as I understand it, the current design is looking at only upgrading the pump station at Forest Run. Okay. <clears throat> and do you, do they have a longer term, um, long term capital improvement project that um, might fit in with, with the construction that you contemplate for water and sewer on this project? Originally, what was noted um, included or provided for the ability to upgrade the force main and great mills as well. Um, as I understand it, just within the last couple weeks from conversation between Dewberry and RK and K, if I remember correctly, is who their engineer is. Um, there is no work proposed in the force main. Future, I do not know. All right, so you have no, Dewberry, who is your civil engineering firm, is that correct? Correct. And they are, have, are coordinating all the proposed work for your project with RKK, who happens to be the engineer from Metcom, is that correct? So RK and K is the engineer who is working on the forest run pump station uh, design work currently and our engineers have reached out to them to try and get information so that whatever they're proposing we can ensure that our design will take that into effect. But RKK you understand is working for METCOM? Correct, not for us. Um, so and and all the everything shown on this concept plan from a water and sewer standpoint would be constructed at um, source grant expense, is that correct? Correct. Unless discussions can be made as far as what METCOM can would be able to utilize 
in which case if they're able to use work with us we would work with them for construction as needed all right but that when you say excess when you talk about that that would be primarily related to the excess capacity that you anticipate creating on the force main that you would put in great mills road is that correct correct not uh, not at anything on site itself is that correct no although potentially the water tower it could help to serve additional water capacity if they needed it and wanted it all right in but it's currently designed for what we need because that's serving our site. But you have had, had you not, conversations about oversizing that water tower to meet any additional needs that METCOM may have. Is that correct? Correct. That's all I have for Ms. Murray on that particular topic. Let me ask Ms. Murray a question because I missed is, I heard the pump station's in phase one. Is the water tower phase one? It would have to be in phase one as well. Also, let me, um, we always hear METCOM talk about we get no new customers, we get no new customers to generate additional monies. Would Stewart's Grant be paying for each, I know each EDU, would they be paying the capital contribution fees on 1,122 units as they are built? Or is there a, I mean, there's a fee to connect in addition to the EDUs, I think. There is a connection fee, yes. So the- Metcom's coming up. Metcom, Metcom would. Metcom. And that's good, because I may be misstating. I just wanted to know. Don't want to put words in her mouth. <laughs> All right. Good evening, Christy. Good evening. And I didn't get sworn in. I'm sorry, I stepped in a little late. I just. Let you know. You did or did I not? I did not. Oh. Well. Sorry, I had T ball, so. <laughs> Raise your right hand. You declare and affirm under the penalty of perjury that the testimony, responses, and statements you may give will be the whole truth, nothing but the truth. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Name, please. <laughs> Christy Hollander, McCom. Um, so, as permits come in for the potential build out, they would pay the capital contribution charge as those building permits are, are approved. Okay. So, it's part of the permitting process. No waivers or nothing along the, you know, sometimes no, counties no. give tax waivers and this different stuff. No, but we're, we're not even allowed to waive them per um, Chapter 113. Okay. Yep. Let me ask one more question that I, I always thought that when a project or a house or whatever was building where you have public and water and sewer available, that they had to connect to water and sewer. But why were they given the option to create their own, if they wanted to, their own system? Well, there were a lot of steps to go through to make that happen, so they kind of were looking first to just make sure it was feasible before they started jumping through those hoops, but they would have to have gone through a category change to have the um, CW County Water and Sewer Plan amended to allow that. Okay. And it would have then become a public system, so when they would have built it, turned it over to METCOM. I see. To operate. It would be much like the, the system on Brown Road. Yes. So, yeah. Same, same, same yeah. principle. Okay. Mm -hmm. And Chrissy, what's the regard to uh, the current discharge permits that you guys have out of Marley Taylor? Mm -hmm. Wh where are you with discharge? So you threw out some numbers which were almost spot on. Um, we are um, permitted up to six million gallons per day. We're flowing or somewhere around four. So mm -hmm. we are using approximately, you know, two thirds of our capacity. So we have another third remaining. Yeah, because I know that when everybody comes forward, it's always, it's, you can treat it, but what do you do with the water? Right. And, and I know Maryland, I mean, the people aren't gonna give you uh, more discharge, and to dis the, the permit's not gonna be increased. I don't see that happening. Right, so yeah, and so we have out in um, FY27 um, of our capital improvement plan, a study to look at, you know, what that next step may or may not be. You, you probably get a certain amount <clears throat> by way of science. I mean, you're, you know, you're, your parts per million will get better. Right, you can reduce it down well, and get I mean. more volume. And then right. adjust, do you adjust, do you adjust, or have you adjusted the flow rates, or are they still calculated at where they were? So we we had MDE a review, and they did approve that, it used to be that all flow, all EDUs connected were always calculated at 250 gallons per day. Right. Typically, we're seeing that actually flowing somewhere between 150, 175. Right. Um, so they agreed to take the uh, allocated and um, flowing EDUs at the actual rate that they're flowing versus the 
the 250 gallons per day. So that freed up some additional capacity. So Medcom's comfortable with regard to a bit, the ability to get rid of water after it's treated currently? Yes. Yeah, we don't we don't have to see any problems with what we have up to okay. our permitted okay. amount. Thanks, Chris. Anybody else have any questions for Medcom part of the world? Thank you, ma'am. And then, so just to piggyback on what they were um, noting, so right now they have they have to build what they need for their site. So water, sewer, um, the tower, the pump station. If for some reason we step in and say, oh, we would actually like to see some additional capacity in that water tower to serve other development in that area, we, we could potentially do a, a what we call a developer cost share. We would pay our portion of the increased size um, and then they would design and build it. Um, it kind of works out for both of us. And, and I think that cost sharing concept was included in the original mm -hmm. um, PUD documents what? some 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 time ago. So we're still tracking along with that concept. We just their their plan and our plan has got a mesh, and that's all to be determined, as I understand. It. And in projects like this, it really doesn't make a lot of sense to build just to your capacity for water. Or right. your, your and, needs. Right, exactly. What well, makes sense to come up with some sort of a plan to, mm -hmm. to share to get the added capacity? Yeah, and we're just now finally wrapping up our facilities plan, which looked at all the development in that entire area. So we'll be looking at that to give us guidance on what size that tower we may want to increase it to. That's it. Thank you. I'm here if you need anything else. Thank you. We're not shy. Ask Mr. Gotch, he'll tell you. <laughs> and just to reiterate as i said we we started those conversations with them two years ago and we'll continue to have those conversations to make sure our needs get met with that unless you've got any other questions ms murray i'm going to bring up mike Klebosco. okay thank you thank you Mr. Good evening. Why don't you state your full name and give uh, the board or the commission a little bit of sense of what it is that you do. Uh, Mike Clavasco, I'm with Wetland Studies and Solutions. I'm an environmental consultant. I've been working on this project. Our firm did the wetland delineation study and the forest and delineation study for this project. Okay, and what's the purpose of a wetlands delineation study? The purpose of the wetland delineation studies determine the boundaries of wetlands and other jurisdictional features such as streams and ponds. Uh, we did the delineation and had it confirmed last August by the Maryland Department of the Environment and the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, both in writing. Excuse me. I'm sorry. Did I swear you in when we started this evening? Uh, I'm sorry? Did I swear you in when we started this yes. evening? Yes. Okay. Okay. I got to ask everybody. Sorry. And last time, too. <laughs> <laughs> I remember the front row. Didn't remember the back. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> And thank you, board members, for keeping an eye on me. Carry on, I'm sorry. No problem. Um, so you say, the, and were the approval of the delineations from the uh, Maryland Department of the Environment and Army Corps of Engineers submitted to Lugum? They were, I believe. It would have been done by with the project uh, submission. And, and what ongoing um, involvement is MDE going to have in this project? Well, if we have any impacts to 25-foot wetland buffers, 100-year floodplain streams or wetlands, we will need authorization from the Maryland Department of the Environment. And if we have any impacts to wetlands or streams, we'll also need authorization from the Corps of Engineers. All right. It, 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 is any work, there's, there's a uh, body of water called the Hilton Run, which, which floodplain goes to the eastern boundary of the property. Is that correct? Yes, it runs along the eastern boundary, that's correct. And you didn't delineate that area, why not? We did not delineate it because uh, there's no intention to impact any areas within the 100-year floodplain, so it was omitted. All right, and then um, the, the, a portion of that lies within the Tier 2 watershed. How are you going to address the water quality issues related to that Tier 2 watershed as this project moves forward? Well, that's the, the, all those issues will be addressed at the next phase, once we go through the detailed design and review process. All right, well, could you tell the com commission, generally speaking, how, or give them examples of how those concerns might be addressed? 
uh, something we can do redundant stormwater controls, uh, redundant silt fence, sediment erosion controls, uh, reforestation where possible. There, there's a lot of ways, uh, and to save the higher quality forest on the site. And you did a forest and delineation as well, is that correct? That's correct. All right, and um, could tell the commission, please, a little bit about your results of that study. Yeah, I'll start with a little bit of the history of the site. Back in the early 2000s, over 50% of the site was cleared. Um, and since then, there's been a fairly monotypic stand of Virginia pine and Lobolly pine that's come in relatively young. Uh, the more mature forest, which is located in the floodplain along Hilton Run and, in, uh, and along a few of the little wetland fingers that come up into the site, that mature forest is not going to be touched. Uh, we're going we're to preserve their in environmental buffers. Most of the work that we're going to do is going to be located within the young pine stand that has regenerated since the previous clearing was done on the site. All right. Um, and then I don't you I, I believe that you're familiar with the letter to the editor from a um, the St. Mary's uh, River Watershed Association. Uh, I do believe I read that a few days ago. All right, and it, it raises a number of, of of concerns. Can can the concerns raised in that letter be be addressed? Oh, I believe they can be addressed. It's, you have to go through the site design process, and and there are a lot of different mechanisms for minimizing impacts to environmental features on the site. All right, and you, it's this somewhat redundant, perhaps, but it indicates that soils of the sloping site are classified as highly erodible soils, and there's a potential for severe degradation of the rivers, <coughs> and it's a serious, legitimate concern. How would you how would the concern about highly erodible soils be addressed during the permit or site plan review process? Well, the environmental buffers are already expanded somewhat to include these sensitive areas. So by staying out of them as much as we can to start is gonna be one good way. We'll just have to again look at the sediment control features. If we need to do redundant features, like maybe two rows of silt fence instead of one, that's a possibility. You just gotta look at each, each section of the site's gonna be unique and you gotta tailor the design to minimize um, adverse impacts. And then the project has been reviewed by Soil Conservation District for St. Mary's County as well. Do you have that understanding? Uh, that I do not know. Okay. Um, and do you expect any further involvement from the Army Corps of Engineers in the regulatory or review of this project? Only if we impact a wetland or a stream, otherwise the, US, the Corps of Engineers will not be involved but the Maryland Department of the Environment will be to ensure that there's no adverse impact to those sensitive areas, is that correct? Well, they will look at impacts to the jurisdictional areas that they regulate, and there may be some minor disturbances to a 25-foot buffer. It may be an outfall in a wetland, so that would bring, or near a wetland, that would possibly bring them into the review process. And uh, do you uh, have an understanding as to whether or not all the regulatory requirements can be met during the site? Um, plan process with respect to any environmental concerns and applicable regulations. Mr. Watt. Oh, I, I think they can. All right. I haven't got anything else. Question. What regulatory body will tell you whether you're going to have to do a double fence or, and you said it's based upon the design at the time? Well, I think St. Mary's County's, it, it, St. Mary's County's going to look at that, and MDE will be looking at it as well during the Tier 2 review. They'll, they'll be reviewing it? Yes. Correct. Any other questions from the board? Questions to educate me. Uh, the lake, how is it fed? I believe it's a combination of rainwater. It's mostly rainwater and some groundwater. Okay. In other words, it's not a stream. It's not blocked up anything. No. No, sir. And how does that? How will it be impacted by stormwater management? Is that where you're dumping a lot of it, or? I would defer that question to the project engineer. They design the stormwater. I don't. Oh, okay. Does that mean you get to come up again? <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions of Mr. Kobosko? Thank you, sir.
Thank you. Sir, did we get a chance to swear you in? Yes, I was here in the meeting. Thank you. Another face. Huh? Why don't you give the commission your name and tell them what it is that you do, please. Uh, yes, good evening. Uh, my name is Brian Folk uh, with Dewberry Engineers out of the Atlanta, Maryland office and uh, project manager uh, in the engineering group. What was your last name again? Uh, Folk, F-O-C-H-T. Okay. So I think to answer the question about the uh, stormwater, yeah. we'll be uh, designing um, environmental site design throughout the site, which is uh, submerged gravel wetlands, uh, microbioretentions, and bioswales that will be outfalling to the streams, not necessarily to the pond. Okay, to the stream, not to the lake. Correct. Okay. That's all I've got. Luckiest man in the crowd. You are a lucky man. You're the luckiest man. <laughs> oh, you, took her, you took her spot from last hearing, so it <laughs> goes down. Ms. Chandler, maybe the next hearing, you'll only be able to, no, I, I, was, I wasn't calling you. I'm just saying maybe next hearing, you'll only get, have to answer two questions. Don't, don't, don't think though. No. <laughs> um, again, I'm not sworn in, but if you want to, from, from a hydrology standpoint, um, there were two portions of this property mined. One, in the place where the lake currently exists, and then there was a pit that they did further in the site. They expected that pit to fill up with water just as the first one did. It didn't. Too much sand. Much to everybody's, well, they, they didn't leave much sand in there, so, I, but, so <laughs> even with out. that gone, um, it never filled up with water. So they had a hydrology study done and actually the way their water was flowing, it flowed actually, it's all groundwater, and it flows back and forth between Sanders Lake and the lake that got built, and that's as far as it goes given the underground flow of the water. So it's all rainwater and underground streams. So with that, this is Jackie Chandler, um, she may be from Well, before you, before you go there, tell me what you're gonna do with that. You brought it up, I didn't. Tell me what you're gonna do with that uh, pit. Which that, pit? The pit that you said the water wouldn't flow into. Oh, they're gonna fill, they're gonna, gonna it's filled. gonna be graded and filled up and sloped in to fit the rest of the project. And I believe some of it's already been done. That's the park area. Yeah, so they're gonna fill it up and they're gonna make it a park because you can't really build a house on top of that without an ex ex extraordinary expense. Okay, thank brings, you, sir. Brings up a question from a while back on a not different board. There's no shallow wells in the area, are there? There's, I'm, I'm assuming not. I don't consider it an Amish area. But. If there were any shallow wells in it, given the hydrology and everything, it's I presume that, that Cheney or Mr. Knott would have heard about it during the course of mining, and we didn't, so I don't think that there Okay. Are. Okay. Any other questions? I did get to swear you in. <laughs> <laughs> I swore you in. Yes, I have been sworn in. Uh, for the record, Jackie Chandler with Traffic Concepts. All right. Ms. Chandler, what do you do for a living? I am a traffic consultant with Traffic Concepts. I have been with the firm for 30 years this year. All right. And what's your familiarity or what's your role been in this project to date? So I started work on this project in 2008. Um, going through the scoping process for a traffic study, I was not involved with the initial traffic study as part of the original PUD. Um, I did prepare a traffic study in 2012 and then an update in 2021, which was again updated in 2022. Um, the the original traffic study in 2012 assumed 1,633 units. Uh, in 2021, 1,219 units. When we did the update in 2022, um, part of the reason we did the update was to get updated traffic counts because of COVID issues. Um, the study assumed 1,154. Uh, it's now down 
proposed at 1122. So our, our study is a little bit conservative, our 2022. So the traffic counts in the most recent 2022 study were done in 2021. And according to State Highway, um, you know, we're sort of back to a new normal for traffic. But in order to do a worst case scenario, I did add, um, we call it a COVID factor. So I went back and compared, used State Highway data to compare 2021 volumes to pre-COVID 2019. So the difference there was about 5.7%. So we took the 2021 traffic counts and added 5.7% to every movement. Just to, in case it goes, you know, we say we're back to the new normal because there is a lot of teleworking that still occurs. Um, understood that the base is sort of in flux. So we did add that growth factor. So we were being conservative in our results. Um, so the results of the study showed all intersections were C or better, levels of service required to be a D or better in this area. Um, state, state Highway has approved that traffic study. Um, so what, could you generally tell the commission what the, what intersections were you tasked by Lugum with studying? So we did, um, as part of the scoping process and every, since our 2020, 2012 study to the current, um, we've looked at 246 at Carver School, uh, 246 at 237, five at Bay Ridge, and five at 246. And those have been the study limits throughout. All right, and and that those study limits are not of your making, they're of Lugums, is that correct? That is correct. Okay, and in addition to working with Lugum, you worked with State Highway, is that correct? Yes. Could you briefly tell the commission about your contact with State Highway on this project? So our traffic impact study is submitted through the state process as well as the county process. Um, state Highway did come back with some comments. We addressed their comments and concerns and they subsequently approved the traffic study. Okay. Um, you've had, you've heard some concerns, right? You've been, you were present at the last hearing, is that correct? That is correct. All right, and you've um, also had an opportunity to review the January 5th, 23 memorandum submitted by DPWT to the Planning Commission, is that correct? That is correct. All right, and have you had conversations with um, both State Highway and DPWT concerning the content of um, that memorandum as submitted as part of the TEC review process? Yes, I have. Okay, and specifically what, what areas have you focused on in those conversations? So the focus, um, you know, with DPW and T and the State Highway Administration and actually from some of the um, residents uh, has been the, the connection through the Bay Ridge community as well as the Maryland 5 at Bay Ridge intersection. Okay, and what, with respect to, what concerns have been raised about Bay Ridge as a through road or through fare? So there has been a lot of discussion, um, a lot of concern about that road being constructed as a bypass or a cut through road. Um, it's not the intent of this developer, and I um, would expect it's not the intent of the county to make this a through road, a bypass road of any sort. Um, we've looked at some options there to discourage cut through traffic and allow this to just be a residential road that's used by the new community as well as the residents of the existing Bay Ridge. Um, some of those things include narrowing down the road, um, traffic calming devices that we can look at, uh, you know, things like um, you can put little median areas 
that sort of force people to turn their wheel to go around it so that sort of slows people so we want to we want to discourage this as being a cut through road so there has been a, a discussion about the design of that road that will come in the future as the individual parcels come in now no no there's uh, those discussions about the manner in which to, to do it are still ongoing is that right that is correct right, but you have an understanding um, correct that the developer is willing to engage in those conversations with DPWT to address those concerns. Yes, absolutely. All right. Now, what sort of options are available um, to um, address the concerns at the intersection of Bay Ridge with Route 5? So Bay Ridge at Route 5, um, in the initial study, traffic study that was done in 2012, it was a much more intense PUD than it is planned now. So at that point in time, it met the traffic signal warrant for the peak hour warrant. So when we look at traffic signals, we look at the, it, it's mostly based on the left turns that come out of the side street. Um, and there's volume warrants that are required to be met. And that number is around 75 left turns for eight hours of the day. So when you get to that level, we start to look to see if traffic signalization is required. Now, in the 2021 and 2022 studies, much less intense development, we don't get to that 75 number for eight hours of the day. Um, we don't even get to that number during the peak hour. So if, if we don't get to that level, we look for other things that we can do um, operationally. Now, this intersection is an A-level service from a capacity standpoint. Um, the capacity does not look at safety and operational issues. It looks at strictly at the capacity. Um, so we have gone back and looked at some things based on you know what we've heard from the community mostly um, about how to make that intersection operate in a in a better manner. Um, I believe that Mr. Wyro mentioned initially um, in his opening statement that we did we have looked at the possibility of a I'm going to call it a pork chop island because that's what we call it in the industry. Um, that would restrict people from getting in that D cell lane that's intended for people to turn right uh, from five onto Bay Ridge, um, it would force them to make that movement. Um, because there was some concern that today folks are getting in that lane early and then just driving through to get in what becomes the right turn lane for 246. Um, so we have looked at that as an option, um, talked to the state highway about some other options. So all of that's still ongoing, all of those discussions. And that will be mostly a state highway issue. Um, we will involve the county, obviously, DPWNT in conversations. Um, we will look at marking that as two lanes outbound. I know that Section 5 of Bay Ridge offered that improvement as well, but I don't know where they stand in the process. Um, so that will be something that would be, you know, suggested when we get, make, once the connection's made. All right, and so to, to, your, to your point, S, you're gonna have to get the approval from SHA, whatever you do at that intersection, is that correct? Correct. All right, and um, although, the the intersection you indicates functions at an a level of service even after you um, route all the traffic out of this project as you indicated that does not um, address any safety issues is that correct that's correct all right and how did you become aware of the safety issues uh, mainly from discussions or um, with the community or you know here he hearing their complaints we haven't heard their complaints yet but um, reading the um, letters that are in the record all right well did you ha um, have a conversation with one of the um, residents of that community whose wife was involved in an accident at that intersection I did not personally have the conversation with him um, after the last hearing but um, I, w I did discuss it with the uh, developer all right and um, the the improvements at the intersection are addressed to 
uh, or an, an attempt to address the safety concerns um, raised by that individual and the condition at that intersection, which from that from the perception of the citizens caused or allowed that accident to to occur. Is that correct? That's correct. That would not be an APF issue. Would be a safety issue. Okay. And you've had those discussions with EPWT, and those discussions are ongoing. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. Um, now, w w what if any plans does State Highway have? If you know, in um, the general area of the intersection of Route 5 and Bay Ridge and Route 5 and Great Mills Road? Uh, there is a State Highway project. Um, Mr. Gotch talked about it previously um, that will create a, a four lane section and rebuild the bridge that's west um, on Maryland 5 west of 246. It will provide also in addition to the two through lanes, bike lanes and sidewalks. And I'll add to that, that it was also in the priority letter from the commissioners to the state highway to keep that project moving forward. Just a moment, please. Um, do you have the uh, DPWT comment letter in front of you by any chance? I do not. Right, here, let me show you. <clears throat> Take a look at this one, two, three, four, fifth bullet point in the... The concept plan? Yes. The concept plan should speak to yourself and ask, her, ask oh, I'm sorry. tell the commission how you're going to intend to address the concern raised by that comment. So this comment um, it discusses the the roundabout that's internal to the site. So Carver School Road, where it will connect to Bay Ridge, once Bay, uh, the extension of Bay Ridge, uh, that intersection is designed as a roundabout. It will be a roundabout. I think there was some con some confusion with DPW and T um, that they assumed that we analyzed it as a T intersection. We did not, um, but we also did not analyze it um, because it's internal to the site. After getting this comment, I did go back and look at the numbers as a roundabout there, and it does operate acceptably at A levels of service as a roundabout. Now, w were you asked to to study um, the intersection of Peg Road and Westbury? Uh, no, that was not part of the scoping agreement with the county. Nonetheless, as part of the traffic analysis, did you um, assess the number of left turns that would be made from Great Mills Road onto Westbury um, as part of your traffic impact study? Not as part of the traffic impact study. Have you, sent, have you uh, uh, gone out and done traffic counts of the number of cars making that left-hand turn off Great Mills Road onto Westbury Road <laughs> since the traffic impact study was prepared? Yes. After the traffic impact study was prepared, we did go back and take a look at the intersection of Westbury and Peg. We conducted a traffic count on March the 15th, 2023. Uh, we ran a capacity analysis of that intersection at A levels of service. And what percentage of vehicles going um, down the Great Mills Road in the AM peak are making a left-hand turn onto Westbury? Of the, of the volume of traffic that's going through that intersection. From Peg? No, from? From Westbury to Peg? No, from Great Mills to onto Westbury. 
from Great Mills onto Westbury was part of our traffic impact study. Okay, and what percentage of the through traffic in the a in the AM peak is making a left hand turn onto that road? Existing today, there are 13 lefts in the morning peak and 31 in the evening. Okay. Uh, at a volume of how many car um, trips through that intersection? Uh, there's probably 20,000 trips through that intersection. So what percentage are taking making the left-hand turn on the Westboro? Very low, less than 1%. So uh, to understand your testimony and to sum it up, turn it over to the, to the commission because I'm sure they have, they're gonna have a lot of questions for you. Um, SHA's raised, raised concerns about the TIS you submitted and uh, to your understanding, the um, solutions offered satisfy SHA's concerns. Is that correct? That's correct. And the same with respect to DPWT, is that correct? That's correct. And to the extent that they weren't completely satisfied, there are on, ongoing discussions and means and methods by which all the concerns raised to date can be satisfied, is that correct? That is correct. I haven't got anything else for Ms. Chandler at the moment. Can you educate me on southbound on five, where you turn into the development. Will that be an extra left turn lane proposed in there? Or is it off of the main single lane? Yes, today there is an existing shoulder that's used as a bypass lane. Yeah. It's now legal to cross the, the white line to bypass. I understand. <laughs> so um, the way it is today, there is, is bypass. Is the way it will be then? In other words, there won't be a, it won't be widened to put a separate little left turn. It will, it will not be widening, but we are still talking to State Highway Administra Administration about some options there. To piggyback real quick off of Mr. Brown's question, one of my questions was, are any road improvements being done? I know you can't use the word proffer or mitigate because of legal issues as Mr. Wyro stated, within the HUD documents with, with all the roads around there, is anything being done to any road as an upgrade? So without any proffers, from an APF standpoint, everything works at an acceptable level. Now, keeping in mind that APF <clears throat> is again gonna be addressed at each phase as each phase comes in. Um, at this time with our projections, everything is an acceptable level of service. Um, there were there are some queuing issues that are discussed in the traffic impact study. Um, you know there's there's some deficiencies in left turn bays that could be improved. Um, one of those turn bays is is part of the state highway project so Theoretically, that'll be improved at some point. Um, the other is the northbound left turn from 246 on to 237. Um, it's deficient by about 160 feet today. Um, this project does not add anything to that, um, but it could be restriped and remarked. So my, my question is, this development is not doing any road improvements around the Great Mills area at this, that's already laid out or structured. They would, that's correct. They would not be technically required to at this point. Again, it will be tested at each phase. Um, at this point, everything works at an acceptable level. So that's yeah. correct. That was another, and I always question you on, on these things. And I know you guys look at the codes that we give you or the state highway gives you, but when I first got on this board in 2016, there was a whole lot of documents that showed most of that Great Mills intersections was an F, E and an F. And I don't really see what was done to bring them up to A, B, and C. At five at 246, the issue there is queuing. 
not capacity. So there are enough lanes to handle the volume, and that's a capacity issue. And that's what we test for your APF law, is capacity. Um, there is a queuing issue, obviously, that's why State Highway has a project there to improve the queue. Um, again, it's... I, I, don't, I don't see the difference. If a car has to sit in traffic for 45 minutes to make a turn, I don't care if you call it queuing or capacity, it, it's to the community and to us, it's still a problem. I know they're allowing you to use these codes that aren't really up to date anymore. Right, that's your APF law. I understand, and I'm not beating you guys up on it. You're taking advantage of, of poorly written documents mm -hmm. that are 25 years old, um, but it still doesn't, you know, doesn't make any sense that not much has been done through that area up Great Mills Road, and miraculously we're at a C when we was at an E and an F. I know a little bit of a lane's been added here and there to turn on the 237 and. You know, a couple of things have been made longer and stuff, but the traffic is um, in that area is is bad, and st it was even bad through COVID. On Great Mills Road, wasn't as bad as prior to COVID, and I do think that I think somebody made a comment that the um, work from home wasn't happening as much. Well, everybody that I know that works on the base is still working from home. Ninety percent of the people that I know is still working from home. And I think eventually, I'm not sure if some more of that will go away. I tend to believe that it will, mm -hmm. um, but it hasn't. And so I don't think the traffic totals are really what they will be. And um, well, remember that we did add 5 a COVID factor. Right, I understand that. To get I back to pre-COVID numbers. I, I understand. Um, let me touch on a couple more things since I've got you here. Um, dur during this project, I know it's in phases of 10 to 12 years, um, but ultimately when you get done, are there only um, Carver School Road and Bay Ridge Road in and out of that project of all of them homes at it? That's correct, other than the extension that they're providing that, you know, if others can make the connection, it will ultimately have a connection to Willows. But until that happens, yes, you're correct. It's two access points. Okay. And I think at the last meeting, we established that all roads would be up to county and state standards. Because I've written in there, it doesn't have to be, but somebody made a comment at, at our last meeting. Not, not you, somebody on the, um, said that all the roads now would be up to county and state standards, even though it says in the PUD doesn't have to be. I believe that was Ms. Murray. Okay. And I believe it related to the width of the roads, but she can come back up and clarify it if, if, if you want to. Yeah, I don't think she limited. I think she said that they had agreed you I think that they've already, I think that they've just, I think the PUD document allows the roads to be narrower, but I think that they've just designed them to county standards. So which I think is what she said. By it. Come back up and confirm it for the record since we questions been raised. Um, yes. So as far as the roads that are proposed, the widths and right of ways in the sections are per county standards. So so in retrospect, all the roads, whatever is required by the state and county, would be adhered to. I mean, you're saying the widths, but I'm saying if, if something said you had to have a four foot shoulder, you're not saying you're gonna pick and choose parts of the code. Correct. To use. You're gonna come up to county and state standards for the road. Correct. Okay. And um, somebody, I think you'd already answered the question about the, the circle at Bay Ridge and Carver School, because I think the plan looked like it was a T. But you had already said it's a circle. Yeah, I believe it's designed okay. as, a, as a roundabout, yes. Let me, let me ask the developer a, a traffic question. Most PUDs have a, and I did look through the PUD document, but it's mind boggling. You know, it's so, it's so large. Most PUDs have traffic thresholds. When you exceed X amount of trips, 
you have to do something else. When you exceed another threshold of, of traffic, something else has to be done. Leon Wildwood had it, um, the one across the street from Wildwood has it, that as they it, reach a certain number, things have to be done. Was, is, is that a part of Stewart's grant? It is, and I'm, I'm, I can, I had my finger on it the last time we were here. There are um, stages in the document, if I can find it in a few minutes, which stipulate that in addition to what is done at the site plan stage, that when they hit a certain threshold, they're going to go back and look at it again insofar as the number of units being being built. So if that's what you, what you're, what. It, it usually requires, and I, I know you can't proffer or mitigate in this particular instance, but it usually takes into account some sort of, like Wildwood had to redo lanes out on 235 and the one across the street has to extend the, on the next level, they have to extend the road from Route 4 up to their, you know, to make the third lane. I mean, there's usually a proffer of something that's going to benefit other than just the development. Well, and all right, so, so I believe I've indicated to you the types of things they are going to look at. I mean, they want to make the intersection of Bay Ridge and Route 5 safer. So they're going to continue to to look at that without waiving my, my my position. So that's an offsite improvement. I mean, there are uh, the, you know, the the bypass lane that Mr. Uh, Brown referred to when people are making a left-hand turn into the project. That's something that they're going to look at with, with, with State Highway. I mean, like we said before, it doesn't make sense for them given their desire to have a successful project to ignore the fact that you've got these vehicles down there that are sitting in in the line to make in line in a, as you say 45 <laughs> minutes it just doesn't make sense for them to sit there because who's going to want to live there and put up with that on a daily basis so i can't sit here and tell you that there is a specific improvement that needs to be made and it's at a specific date that's incorporated in this document it's not but they, they, as you've heard tonight, and, and as I, I've said, they've had ongoing conversations with DPW, not to put Mr. Gotch on the spot again, but I think he can verify at least that they had, have had the conversations that are not for appearance sake only, and there's been ongoing conversations with SHA, and assuming this project gets approved, those conversations are gonna continue after, after the approval because it makes good business sense for them to have have the conversations in addition to, in addition to everything else that you um, described concerning the regulatory concerns. So, I mean, do they want to go out and upgrade uh, Route 5 to a four-lane road down on on um, at that intersection at their expense? No, but do they want to leave it in a safe un, in a condition where it's unsafe for people to get out on five? They're, they don't want to do that either. So it's it, there's a balancing um, test involved, but they do recognize the concerns and they want to continue to try and resolve them. Understood, and that's appreciative. I'm just asking that there's, this particular PUD doesn't have thresholds. If, if the APF studies and the TIS studies had concluded that an intersection was an F and then there would have been a way to fix that F. That way would have been disclosed and discussed, and it would be part of the APF, you know, decisions and proffers being made and part of their TIS. Because the, the intersections function as required under the APF, as we said, many of them continue to stay at an A, notwithstanding you know the reference to some outdated standards and I can't tell you whether or not they are or they aren't but if it's if it's functioning at an A it's functioning as at, at an A and I, I'm assuming that if SHA or DPWT disagreed with that assessment they'd have said so um, so I understand your your concerns but right now um, they're willing to discuss making improvements that they're not required to make and otherwise, under APF, there's no improvements required. 
Understood. My point on the record is the PUD document has no threshold for traffic to make any improvement. It, you will look at things, but there's, there's not a hard written rule in there like most of them that says when we reach 500 trips, we will do this. When we reach 1,000 trips, we will do this. When we reach 1,500 trips, we will do this. There's none of that in there. And I think that was because, Mr. Van Kirk, that at the time that the, that the PUD was approved, the TIS submitted in conjunction with the PUD and which was, you know, this binder here is all the paperwork that was prepared in conjunction with, with the approval of the PUD. So it got analyzed. I'm guessing I wasn't around, but had there been, had the TIS shown back then that improvements were re required given the degree to which this project was analyzed, the requirements would have been in here. So, and, and the PUD documents contemplate we're gonna do updated traffic studies. They've been updated and they support the same conclusions which were made when it was initially approved. Okay, I'll... I think that's all I have on traffic right now. I'll move on to somebody else. Mr. Evans. Yeah, so <clears throat> the idea of the operation of intersections, you sort of alluded to it. My understanding is that if an, if an intersection is operating at A or a B, um, the impact that you or anybody's development on that intersection is it has to be maintained at the current level. Is that accurate? That's not accurate. If if it fails, the developer is required to bring it back to the condition it was in prior to their development. Yeah, but it has to do with their with their with whatever their impact is. Right, but only if the intersection is an unacceptable. Yeah, level. yeah, I, I, I probably worded that wrong. So. Um, okay, so if it if it drops below what the, what the current what the what, what it is currently, then they have to address that shortfall. Only if it was a failure. So failure. Okay. Right. If it, w it it's an A today, and if for some reason under future conditions it went to an E, right, they would only have to bring it back to a D. They wouldn't have to bring it all the way back to all the way back up to an A. Right. Okay. It, with regard to. Uh, uh, moving north on five, the dedicated right lane that you that you spoke with about, mm -hmm. those are all. I don't know why the state would have an issue. They're all along Route 235, mm -hmm. and for the very same reason that that it's talked about here. Uh, that said, those people moving in that shoulder would have to make that right hand move. Mm -hmm. It's not going to take away people's bad behavior, you know, beyond that. Uh, how, wherever, you know, that dedicated right onto Great Mills Road, but it would stop people from flying up the side of that, that road, we you know, and with all that traffic is stopped. So, mm -hmm. my two cents. Mr. Chairman, if I may. Yes, sir, please. Uh, Mr. Van Kirk, in response to your question about thresholds, I'm not sure this is completely pertinent or what you were looking for, but page 18 of the development plan, uh, number two under adequate public facilities, does provide there's going to be a new traffic study uh, for review and approval after the first 850 dwelling units or equivalents are put in and for every 150 dwelling units put in thereafter. So there's going to be automatically that in addition to whatever APF findings and if appropriate mitigation that might have to be determined by the planning director periodically. That's also baked into the development plan. Okay, thank you. M Mr. Hauser, can I ask a question there? I, was it a traffic impact study or a traffic signal warrant analysis? Traffic signal warrant. And, uh, well, words are traffic study for the purposes of determining signal warrant analysis. Signal warrant. Of course, that was based on the 1700, right? Homes as opposed to the 1122. Right. So that was going to be a little less than halfway over, and you were going to see far more or frequent updates every 150 thereafter. So you're going to hit 850 and then only get two more traffic studies after that under the current build out. But that's one of the consequences of reducing the numbers. To, to, to be clear, the traffic studies required at those thresholds is for the purpose of a single warrant analysis only, not traffic impacts generally. That's but, accurate. And the, That's for the state. The state will warrant the traffic signal or no. And the only place we're looking at a traffic signal would be Bay Ridge in five? 
That's my understanding. Mm -hmm. That's that correct. <clears throat> Anybody else got any questions? I the question is: Have you read or seen the sheriff's input? I have. Okay, I just didn't know if those. In other words, he was projecting that there'd be fi roughly 1,500 more cars in the area. Is that included in your traffic study? Yes. Um, our traffic study, um, just to be clear, the counts were done when schools were in session. So the counts do include, um, you know, the volumes that are associated with the schools today, the vehicular volumes, the buses, and that sort of thing. Um, the site is projected to to generate about 7,800 ADT, which are average vehicle trips per day. That's trips, not vehicles. So one vehicle, if it travels in, is one trip. The same vehicle, when it comes out, is the second trip. Um, so, so that average ADT takes into account that, you know, you're not just having one vehicle um, leaving the site and coming back at the end of the day. No. You do have other you know because they're all parked around. over on the road and mr fasikas is worried about <laughs> <laughs> um, hmm. i take it that what you're looking at is possible shall we say slowdowns for him or keep cutting out the shortcuts would be things like three-way stops all the way all the way down the the uh, main drive we have where the roads feed in so you've got a north south and then a coming in from the right we have, I have discussed the, that option with DPW and T. Um, typically, you know, we don't like to use stop signs as a form of slowing down traffic. There are actual volume warrants that you want to meet before you put in a three-way stop. Um, so that's sort of off the table. We're still discussing that. Um, some other options are these little mini roundabouts that you can put in the center um, just to force people to go around. Um, there is an area in Bethesda, I'm not sure if it, and everybody's familiar with that area, but um, there are uh, choker islands, so that you, you just narrow the pavement down and it slows people down, or you shift them over just a little and bring them back just to keep the speed slow and to eliminate that. Yeah, I'm just thinking of speed. Actually, if you don't have volume, you got, you're going to increase the speed. Right. Is what's going to happen. Yeah. Yes. Volume will slow it down. Mm -hmm. And narrow, narrow roads are not inherently bad for the very reason they are traffic calming, you know, especially in, you know, when you get into village centers, town centers, that sort of thing, you wind up with the roads being fairly narrow because they use diagonal parking most places. They've gotten away from parallel parking. So, I'm, you know, those narrower roads have a, have a purpose. And so for those folks that were concerned about the roads on Bay Ridge being too narrow, uh, it may be at some level beneficial for them to be a slightly narrower because it would cut back on the on, the, on speed probably. Yes, agreed. <clears throat> and to reiterate again, without waiving anything, that um, the developer certainly willing to consider discussing with DPWT reducing that Bay Ridge from a four lane back down to a two lane all the way through. Assuming it makes sense from a traffic network standpoint. Mr. Wywow, what was your last statement? You, you got real soft on me. I couldn't hear you. I'm sorry? Your last... Didn't hear you. I couldn't hear the last oh, part. I, what I was last saying is is that is that without waiving anything, it was there are conversations ongoing with DPWT to um, narrow, take that from Bay Ridge from a four-lane road down to a two-lane road. But it's... Uh, the county's got its own sort of interest insofar as what kind of road network it wants to create, and I think that's sort of the conversation where those desires may, may clash a little bit, but that's an ongoing conversation, and the developer is certainly willing to uh, uh, reduce it to help Bay Ridge's concerns about cut-through traffic, and quite frankly, I would imagine that to some degree the people who live in that community would be just as happy if nobody was cutting through either. So, I mean, I guess the point being with a lot of the um, uh, mechanisms which are available for traffic calming, if you will, are to a large degree 
um, require the approval of, and cooperation of both as SHA and DPWT, and sometimes there are conflicting concerns. But they're certainly willing to have a conversation. Any other questions? No. Thank you, Ms. Chandler. Thank you. I am done. Okay. Um, so you're done complete. I have no other witnesses to call. Okay. Nobody else has any other questions? Nothing. Right. So then we're going to start it right up next time with public testimony. So hopefully you are wrapped up. Don't add anything to it. Um, I'll ask you at the beginning of the next hearing if there's something that just happened to come up that you I, want to speak about. I appreciate um, that. <coughs> and then we'll take it to public testimony and try to get things wrapped up. Okay. Thank you. <coughs> I think we had decided on um, May 15th. May 15th. Correct. At least from our standpoint. <coughs> Excuse me. Got to have a motion to do that. Get out of here. No, we have to have a motion to continue it to May 15th. I make a motion that we <coughs> continue to May 15th. Okay. I second. All, all in favor of that motion, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Yeah. Okay, thank you all for your understanding. And we'll see everybody back here on May 15th. Thank you. Okay. <coughs> Any other business? Motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Motion by Mr. St. Clair. Second. Second by Ms. Summers. All in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Okay, we're adjourned.